Thank mm -hmm. you. No, no, no. It's not your problem. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, test. Can you hear me? Test. One, two. Okay, okay. Everything's fine right now. Wirik, you can start. Thank you very much, uh, Wuli, for the very kind introduction, and thank you, Siming Wu and uh, Xiao Jing, for the oh. very kind introduction. Um, I was very happy to receive sorry, this Sorry, Wirik, sorry for interruption. Okay, 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 everything is fine now. There is a okay. delay of about five seconds, actually, the live streaming wow. platform. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Wuli, for the very kind introduction, and uh, thank you, Siming Wu and uh, Xiao Jing, for the very kind invitation to this meeting. I was very excited about it, and in part it was because it um, uh, reminded me of a very uh, wonderful uh, trip that I took to um, China and to Beijing in particular in 2017. So I'll share with you um, some of my fondest memories that I have. Uh, of Beijing, uh, and they are of a social nature. Um, so I discovered that several seniors uh, in this park and probably all around the city are engaging in these um, very different kinds of social interactions um, and activating their social minds in doing so. I also remembered um, that during my trip to China, I became something of an instant celebrity. And this is not because of my science, regrettably, um, but because of my body height. Um, I'm extremely tall, and wherever we went around, we heard whispers of Yao Ming, Yao Ming in the background, and many people uh, wanted to take their picture with me. So you can see here like one group of people uh, and me in the middle uh, taking a picture. And as you're watching, you know, what is happening in this picture, you understand what, what's going on and the sort of immediate human connection that is taking place. And, you know, that was such a wonderful experience uh, for me during my entire trip. It is also an expression of the fact um, that there is a lot of social communication, a lot of social cognition possible in pre-verbal states. Um, I do not speak Mandarin, and so um, there was no direct um, language-based communication possible. Still, we understood each other uh, at a fundamental level and could interact. So um, this gets me to the subject of my talk. Um, my lab is interested in the neural basis of intelligence in general, and we are seeking not exclusively, but mainly the answers to this question, how does the brain generate intelligence in the domain of social cognition? And there are good reasons to do so. So primate etheologists um, have long posited that primates possess very sophisticated, structured social knowledge. So if a primate like us uh, sees an image like this, um, there are three levels at which uh, this primate can understand a social scene like the one that you can see here. At the first level, there's the extraction of information about the individuals. If you are a part of this group of uh, monkeys, for example, you would know them uh, in person and you would know, you know their social status in terms of whether they're juvenile or adult, if they're um, male or female and so on and so forth. And so, so this is the first level of understanding that you have of your social environment in terms of the individuals and their properties. The second level is the level of interactions, understanding what kind of uh, interactions are taking place between individuals, like here the grooming or mothering. The third level, built on these first two levels, uh, entails knowledge of the relationships between individuals, like friendship, kinship, and hierarchy. So these are very intricate data structures uh, that are necessary in order to build such social knowledge. And this is why we're interested in uncovering the neural mechanisms uh, for these very sophisticated data structures. So show knowledge, of course, is not all. Um, if you just know something and uh, don't act on it, it's, it's not useful. So we're also interested in how do you build this knowledge in the first place? How do you use perceptual systems to generate this knowledge? Um, how do you act on this knowledge? We are very interested in facial um, signaling in non-human primates. Uh, and how then do you interact with others? So the kind of interaction that you saw me having with people in the image uh, was a direct interaction, an IU interaction, and we're very interested in, in what is happening there as well. The approach that we're taking basically has two components. Uh, the first component is network-oriented and an attempt to understand which parts of the brain are supporting a particular function. So let's 
Think about face recognition, for example, if we uh, want to understand the monkey brain, how does it analyze faces? Initially, we don't even know like where in this very complex and big brain uh, this process is happening. Um, but with fMRI, it's possible for us to actually localize regions in the brain that are very strongly functionally specialized for the processing of faces. I'm showing them here in a computer inflated uh, macaque brain, the dark regions uh, depicting the cell side that otherwise you wouldn't see. And you see the yellow red regions, uh, those are the face areas, six of them at reproducible anatomical locations, and that is why we can give names to them. So they exist in the right and the left hemisphere. We have uh, 12 of them in total uh, in the macaque monkey brain. And with this approach, using fMRI to identify um, circuit nodes and circuits, uh, we have succeeded to identify several circuits in the macaque brain that are supporting different cognitive functions, like attentional control, like person knowledge, social cognition, emotional functions, and communicative functions, all driven by the one network in the center, uh, that is the network that is analyzing incoming visual information from the face. The second part of our approach is analytical. Once we've identified the components of a network, we would like to understand how they work and how these components work together. So we're interested in all levels of organization from the level of individual cells, illustrated here by face cells, uh, through local circuits. We're very interested in what the roles of different cell types are and how they work together, how then large populations of neurons, which we can image, um, generate uh, codes, um, what the function is of face areas, how they work together as networks, and then how finally they generate a particular behavior like face recognition. So what I would like to do today, I would like to tell you three stories. And let me introduce the main protagonists of these stories in the first place. Uh, Ilka Yildirim on the left-hand side was a wonderful postdoc in the lab, um, also working with Josh Tenenbaum at MIT. He's now faculty at Yale University. Uh, Sophia Landi was an amazing grad student in the lab. Uh, she's also left in the meantime um, to do a postdoc. And the same is true for Zetian Yang, uh, who's just amazing, uh, and is now just a few blocks down the road uh, doing a postdoc on songbirds at NYU. So we are interested, like all primates are, in faces because of the multitude of information that they convey, like the mood of a person, its attentional state, the species, race, gender, age, identity, and so on and so forth. A lot of research on the neural basis of face processing is really centered on one piece of information, uh, and that is identity. So just briefly, what do we know about the macaque brain and how it's processing identity information? So I told you there are these six face areas. I haven't told you that they are packed with face selective cells. Virtually all the cells in these fMRI identified regions are face selective. Um, but if we look a little closer, we soon realize that even though they share this common property of responding to faces, they represent faces differently. And this is why I give these nodes now different colors. We also know that they are directly connected to each other to form a face processing network. So first, in the middle face areas, and I'm showing this here for one, there is a face representation that is not really contained very much information about identity, but a lot about head orientation. This might not surprise you. This is one of the first levels of processing. And the main physical difference between images of faces really is not identity, but it's the head orientation. There's another representation and directly connected face area a little further down uh, stream, where you also have very strong signals of head orientation, but now they are bilaterally symmetric. So cells will respond both to the left profile and to the right profile of a cell. And at the third level of processing, you might find cells that are relatively invariant to head orientation, but are now very sensitive to identity information. Because these areas contain these different face representations and because they're directly connected, we know that what is happening here is that one face representation is transformed into another one, and that one into another one, um, and potentially so on and so forth. But here, this, these two main transformations are really qualitative in nature, really dramatically changing the format in which faces are represented. So we wanted to understand why is this? Why does this network have these properties? And this is really a quest for understanding the computational principles uh, behind this network. So what is it that gives rise to it? Is there something intrinsic about faces that will force on this network these three levels of processing? Or is it something rather the inverse, that there's something about the organization of this network uh, that is enforcing this interpretation, or does it have to do with the learning rule with which this network is wired up? So several years ago, we teamed up with Tommy Poggio and uh, grads in the lab at the time, Joe Leibo, 
And uh, Joel identified that he can reproduce these three qualitative properties that I just mentioned to you in a shallow network, just consisting of three levels of processing. But this network had to be trained with a regularized version of heavy learning, OYAS rule, in order to generate mirror symmetry confusion at the mid-level of processing. Without this learning rule, you would not get this, this kind of processing. So this was the first insight that we got into the computational principles. The basis here, uh, or one of the bases for this insight was the assumption that what this network is for is to perform face identification. And there's good reason for it. I showed you that the neurons contain information about different identities. But if you think about this a bit more, and this is again work that we did with Ilka Yildirim and uh, Josh Tenenbaum, there are very different ways in which this could occur. The standard way illustrated here by vanilla um, deep network is that you basically are trying to attach a label to a given image. You're shown this image and are trying to say directly who it is in this image. Now, a different way of doing this, almost the inverse, or in some sense, actually exactly the inverse of that, is an inverse graphics model in which you are not mapping the incoming image directly onto this label, but onto the latent variables of a three-dimensional face model. Then afterwards, you might be able to identify the person in the image. Now, why is this the opposite? Because if you have this internal three-dimensional model in your brain, you can actually use a forward graphics engine to reconstruct the image. So now you actually have an understanding of the image. You're not just blindly saying who's in the image, but you can reconstruct the image or you can generate it uh, you know, with your own devices. And this uh, provides a very different level of understanding. So do we have any evidence that this is going on in the brain? Present you two pieces of evidence that this might be happening in the brain. This is far from saying that this is actually happening in the brain. So the first level is a more quantitative look at these major transformations that I mentioned before. I told you that there's view specificity at the first level of processing, mirror symmetry at the next one, and then identity selectivity at the third. There's actually a way that we can quantify this that I'm not going to go into, but I'm happy to uh, explain uh, during questions after my talk or um, afterwards offline um, so that we can specify what is the amount uh, of um, selectivity for each of these three components in each of these three levels of processing I mentioned before. And this now allows us to compare the monkey brain directly to artificial neural networks by finding the layers of processing in deep neural networks that are most similar to these three different areas of processing. What we find for the VGG deep processing network, which was the industry standard at the time that we did this work, we find a correlation, a rough correspondence, but not a good qualitative one. If we look in our network, uh, this inverse graphics model, we find a very strong correspondence uh, to the actual physiology. So this is one reason why we think that actually something much more interesting than this sort of mindless mapping on a label might be going on, something like a causal inference. The second level of processing, I would just like to demonstrate you uh, very quickly with an illusion that I love, but we have extensive psychophysics also to support this. And this is in human subjects. So what you think you're seeing here is the bust of Albert Einstein looking at you, but it's now set into rotation motion, seemingly leftward, and you quickly realize that you've actually been looking into the concave part of a mask. Now you will realize it's actually rotating counterclockwise. You look into the concave part again very soon and probably roughly right now. The face is kind of flipping forward for you. You're not really able to see the face in its concave, physically correct interpretation. Your brain is forcing you as a forward-facing convex shape. So these two pieces of information to us suggest uh, that what the brain is doing when it sees an image like this is almost in defiance of information theory, seeing more than what is in the image, making inferences about its three-dimensional structure and about other latent variables of the face. That is to say that the brain has a causal model, which is really uh, a centerpiece of any uh, theory of intelligence that you might have. This work and others are informing also our understanding of face processing systems and how they interact with cognitive circuits. A very fundamental and very influential model that has been incredibly successful over the years is Bruce and Young's model from 1986. At the core of the processing argument that they make is what they call a structural encoding stage that starts with a view-centered description of the face and then goes to an invariant representation um, of the structural properties of the face or the identity. And what I showed you is that 
at least in the mechanical monkey, we think to, to understand uh, the machinery that is doing precisely this transformation. But you can argue that actually what phase processing is for is once further. It's not just to infer some latent variables, but it is, as a deeply social function to identify the people uh, that you're living together. And that is different from phase processing. That is identifying particular familiar individuals. So Sophia Lundy took it upon herself to investigate how does this work? And what she started with was uh, our classic fMRI approach, but now she was contrasting personally familiar faces of the macaque monkeys that she was studying with personally familiar objects. These were toys that the monkeys were playing with. For this contrast, she found the face, same face errors that we've uh, discussed before. But in addition, she found two more areas, one located in perirhinal cortex and the other one in the temporal pole region. Now, this is really just the first indication that these errors that we've never seen before um, might be specialized for the processing of familiar individuals. Um, but Sophia took it several steps further, and one of them was to use a paradigm that I'm going to demonstrate to you here uh, very quickly. So she was starting with images like the two that you're seeing here that are highly blurred, and that then over the course of 32 seconds were very slowly unblurred by adding more and more high spatial frequency information to them. And what you will see here uh, in this unblurring stage, we'll probably recognize uh, former US President Barack Obama, even though the image is still very highly blurred and we are still continuing to add more high spatial frequency information. At this point, you will have identified him, even if I would have, wouldn't have told you that it's him. So on the right-hand side, uh, we have a control stimulus. Uh, this actually is Obama's half brother, and I can keep on adding more and more high spatial frequency information, you will ne never recognize him because you don't know him uh, as an individual. So why am I demonstrating this to us? Why am I telling you this? There is a really cool idea behind this paradigm that we actually did not invent. The idea is that if you have a generic face processing network and you're adding now more and more information to your image by adding more and more high spatial frequency content, um, what you might find in the fMRI response is that the area will increase its response in possibly this linear fashion. But if you have a non-generic face processing area that is interested in particular individuals and might be particularly involved in the process of recognition, you would see this non-linear surge of activation right around the moment of recognition. And what Sophia discovered is that the core face processing network that I showed you initially this only shows this linear increase and shows a mild increase in the amplitude, but not this nonlinearity. And that the two phase areas in the perirhinal cortex and the temporal pole that she discovered actually show this nonlinearity and only show it for familiar faces and not for unfamiliar ones and also not for familiar objects. So this is a second indication to us that this region is specifically, or these two regions are specifically involved in the recognition of particular individuals. So now Sophia went and recorded from the temporal pole region. And she found that indeed this region is very highly specifically engaged in the processing of familiar faces, actually familiar monkey faces only. We suspect a human familiarity area right next to this region. Um, also responding to unfamiliar monkey faces, but much less to. And if you look at individual neurons, she finds some neurons that are very specifically activated just by the face of one particular individual. It's much more work for us to do here to really understand how faces are encoded, but you can see that this is exciting for us because there's some representation here that resembles sort of the idea of a grandmother neuron. However, there are two differences here. One is that this is a very face-specific region. Uh, there's no information that we could find for the voice of the person or for the body of, of the person. It's really still a very face-specific processing unit. And that actually matches exactly what Bruce and Young were predicting in 1986. And I've been asking them how they were able to predict it. I'm, I'm still incredulous that they're proposing like a level of processing that's still face specific, but for familiar faces, but that's exactly what we find. But the second discrepancy is actually also a discrepancy with our model. We found that the response latency of cells in the temporal pole region is actually just as short as the response latency in the high level structural encoding network. Uh, so it looks more like a parallel process rather than a serial one. We'd love to understand how that is working. Lastly, on this part uh, of my talk on area TP, we've been very curious to know whether it also exists in the human brain. 
And postdoc Ben Dean in the lab, who actually just recently started a faculty position at Tulane University, found uh, also a phase similarity region in the human temporal pole. The advantage that we have with non-human primate models is really to go in and record directly from fMRI identified regions, do mechanistic work, and really figure out codes. But the advantage of doing human work is that you can very quickly design um, experiments that get you into the domain of cognition. So what we don't know for the monkey work is like how much is this region really involved in the process of recognition or cognitive processes that go beyond image-based processing. So Ben designed a great number of tasks that I will just go over very briefly. So we had a visual task, very similar to the one I showed to you before for the macaque monkey, where I presented images of familiar individuals to the subject in the scanner, unfamiliar ones, and so on and so forth. But he also designed a semantic uh, task that was purely language-based that no um, face stimuli in them at all. He had questions about episodic memories that people might have about individuals. He had a theory of mind task, and he had a language task. And this is the pattern of activation that he found in this face selective or face similarity selective region TP in the human brain. Yes, on the left hand side, the five bars that you see here show it is very selective for familiar faces, but is responding much more to a semantic processing task uh, for familiar individuals and uh, to familiarity task uh, and episodic memory, also on theory of mind. So in many ways, this region looks a lot like medial prefrontal regions and not just like a visual processing area. So it's really a connection uh, from face processing to uh, cognition. So the last part I would like to talk about uh, briefly and I have to rush through and I apologize for this because we want time for questions. Um, is really coming back to the scheme that I mentioned initially about like how much information faces contain. And we talked about identity, but there's so much more information that faces um, transmit. And so the question really is like, what is a face? And the first answer the vision scientist you would give is it's a category of three-dimensional objects that have very similar structural properties and then small variations around them. But we know from anatomy that actually below the surface of the brain, there's a very highly sophisticated musculature that macaque monkeys actually share with humans. And this musculature is doing something that many objects don't do, and also actually many living objects don't do, and that is to, to change the shape of the face to transmit information about emotional states, for example, or about other properties. So we are very interested in understanding how information about expressions or information about gaze or other dynamic uh, information is being processed in the macaque brain. So we had the first clue from work of Pablo Palosecchi, who was a grad student in the lab, who discovered uh, that actually the areas that are more dorsal in the network, in the face processing network, are responding much more strongly to uh, dynamic faces than ventral areas are. Then another grad student in the lab, Clark Fisher, took this one step further, and he discovered um, that these dorsal areas that are more motion selective are actually specifically selective for natural face motion, not just for any motion, but natural face motion. And that the ventral ones are actually suppressed by natural face motion. They're like uh, unpredictable changes of faces. So this gave us several insights. One is that there is a second gradient to the organization of the face processing network around motion selectivity, but also Clark discovered a seventh face area in the uh, temporal lobe that seemed to be particularly selective for dynamic face information. And so we were like very interested in this region in particular, uh, Zetian Yang was very interested in this region because he realized that it would actually provide very fertile ground to test very basic concepts like in the Bruce and Young model about face processing systems. So why is that? The model proposes two pathways of processing, a dorsal one, and we believe MD is an area for the dorsal processing stream that is processing face motion and the ventral one that is processing facial shape. So the first question that Zetian was asking might be a little surprising uh, to you, but he was asking whether this area MD can actually process static faces. So the rationale here is that if this area is processing dynamic faces, it might be very strongly specialized, but we don't know the answer to this. So he looked at this and very quickly he found that MD cells are very highly selective also for static faces. You can see here uh, responses to monkey and human faces, but not to anything else really. So, and this is true for 84% of MD cells, they're very highly selective uh, for um, static faces as well. 
So this is not predicted by the first model of phase process, since we need a second one, in which really the emphasis is that the dorsal network is processing not changing information, but changeable information. So um, the idea is that the ventral system is processing identity, and the dorsal one thinks like facial expression, head orientation, and gaze direction. So Zetian is asking, do MD cells encode these properties? And the way he was asking this was with a three-dimensional stimulus set in which we varied faces along dimensions of head orientation, expression, which are changeable, and identity, which is structurally not changing. So now we can ask if MD cells are responding to changeable aspects. And yes, they're very selective to head orientation. They're also very selective to expression. Uh, if you want to decode this information, you can do it. Uh, in a confusion matrix, you can see that head orientation, there's really no confusion about it. In expression, there's some confusion about the physically most similar facial expression, but there's a lot of information also about expression. So in a small population of 100 plus cells, we can decode with close to 60% accuracy. So what about gaze direction, the third, third dimension? Just briefly in passing, yes, we can also uh, observe cells, uh, about a quarter of the cells that are selective for gaze direction. So yes, there's information about changeable dimensions of faces, but what about structural information about faces, identity? This, according to this model, should not be processed in MD. And so Zitian was very curious about it. And yes, indeed, he finds that there is information about facial identity, about structural information about faces as well, even better decoded uh, than facial expressions. So this is now forcing a rethinking uh, of face processing systems at large. Uh, because we find properties that are not predicted by the Bruce and Young model. And um, so, so this is really exciting, you know, that this was possible uh, in the PhD thesis, uh, as if you understand. So my quick take-home message is that there is a social mind in non-human primates that we share with non-human primates. It's organized at different levels of processing, that with an fMRI network-based approach, uh, we can identify these networks in the mechanic monkey brain and then target these networks for deeper analyses, revealing how information is encoded in these different processing regions. And this then allows us to identify computational principles that explain why the system might be organized the way that it is. I was emphasizing that this is also a way for us to uh, rewrite uh, inf influential models about face processing. And I was emphasizing the temporal pole, a much understudied part of the macaque and the human brain uh, as a critical node potentially of the social brain and of the social mind. So these are very exciting times for us um, and I will come to an end. I will thank the members of my lab, uh, our funding sources. I should mention that uh, because we're so committed to understanding uh, social cognition, we now have a whole center at Rockefeller devoted uh, to the understanding of the social brain. So thank you again very much for your attention. I'm sorry I had to rush through this so fast. I hope there's still time for questions and thank you again so much uh, for being invited to this wonderful symposium. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Eric. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, do I need to raise my hand or? I... Go ahead. We can okay. hear you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And a nice talk. I have two questions. Uh, the mm -hmm. first question is about the deep, deep neural network. I noticed that you only used two layers when building the deep ne neural network for face recognition. Uh, okay. Uh, hi. And hi. Uh, I wonder, uh, does it uh, does these two uh, layers correspond to a certain layer of VGG? Or yes, yeah, so we did two different uh, kinds of work. The first one was with a flat network, just to say that. A hierarchical network does not need to have many layers of processing like deep networks have to reproduce the three main qualitative properties of the network. What is critical is the learning role. In deep networks, yes, we have you know dozens of layers. We have to select, and we always select the ones that are closest to the ones we see in the brain. Mm -hmm. And um, so in that sense, we find some similarity, um, but also as I was emphasizing uh, differences, unless we do the right kind of mapping. So we have okay, to specify so the computational goal of the system to uh, mimic what we see in the physiology of neurons. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and the, the second question is about the uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, 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 from your results, we saw that some cells can especially uh, recognize the familiar face. Yeah. And 
they have more responsivity uh, to the familiar faces. And I just wonder whether this phenomenon is caused by attention because we know that attention could raise the cells response. And uh, have you ever distinguished uh, between these two mechanics? So we were interested in attention in this study. We we did not control uh, for attention. So mm -hmm. if it was, um, we have some internal control uh, like with novel stimuli and other stimuli that should attract attention. Um, so the, the best of our ability, um, it's not just the higher response, but also the selectivity for faces. Uh, the change from cell to cell and conditions that are otherwise identical, there's definitely something that is not just attention. But if you go by an fMRI response that is bigger to something that, you know, might be more interesting, we have to worry about attention. So I would, just in, in this like sort of few second answer, I would say, if you just look at the fMRI answer, I would give you, yes, you have to be concerned about attention. If you look at the single cells, you don't have to worry about this. This is really about the familiarity of individuals, of, of, of particular individuals. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Professor, I have a question. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, great. So the question is, uh, for the neural encode uh, familiarity, does all these neurons are encode familiarity in the abstract in the abstract level or feature selective level? I mean, if one neuron is only encode some group of monkeys' faces, if they are familiar or not, and other neuron, other group of neuron encode uh, the human faces. Is yeah. familiar or not, or or on the other hand, all the neurons in codes, all these faces, familiar or not familiar. There is a categorical distinction. So the neurons that we recorded from, which were targeting an fMRI identified monkey face familiarity region, mm -hmm. were all monkey face. You know, almost all were like monkey face selective. So so that is a categorical, maybe abstract level. Um, and then there's a very concrete one, in, in that single neurons are particularly selective for only one individual, not for others. There's a gradient there. Some neurons have this category level directly. They respond to all familiar monkey faces, but not to others. And then others are very individual specific. Okay. That's raised some interesting questions about the neural code that-, that um, Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay, we have to move on. Weirik, thank you very much for- Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Our next- the speaker is Professor Corey Miller from, from the University of California, San Diego. Corey received his PhD from Harvard University and did his postdoc with Xiao Qing Wang at Johns Hopkins University. His primary research interests are the neural basis of natural behavior in the primate brain with a particular emphasis on social brain functions. The title of his talk is How Monkeys Really See the World. Welcome, Corey. You can share your screen on. Okay. All right, does that look good? Yes, uh, yes. Great. Well, first, I wanted to thank the organizers um, for inviting me. Um, you know, <laughs> like Wienerich, I've had a wonderful trip to Beijing in the past at Shenghuan, so. Hopefully we'll be able to have meetings like this in person again in the not too distant future. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about uh, kind of a newer line of research in my lab that focuses on um, primate vision, like taking a bit of a different approach to it than what has been done in the past. Um, so in, we have what we would call in neuroscience a Gavagai problem. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with this, um, a number of years ago, several decades ago, actually now, um, Quine wrote a really nice story about um, talking about how we understand information in the world when we hear it. So he used the example of a traveler uh, landing on an island uh, where he didn't know the people and he didn't know the language, um, and he met one of the locals, and as they're trying to communicate, a rabbit runs past on the trail, um, and the local yells out, Gavagai. And the traveler has to figure out, well, what did he actually try to communicate, right? Was he trying to say, oh, rabbit? Did he say, oh, you know, dinner or non-disembodied rabbit parts or any number of the other possible combinations of things that might have been construed in which the individual is communicating? Now, what Quine labeled this was the indeterminacy of translation, right? That when we hear signals or we take in signals, and his example was a language, but this translates or this extends into other contexts, 
you know, we hear these things and we have bits of information, but we're then left to figure out what do they actually mean, right? And in our study of the brain, it's the same exact problem that we have, right? We're recording neural signals. These could be spikes, oscillations, bold signals, any number of the other, you know, bits of information that we, that we measure and record. Um, and then we're tasked with trying to quantify them and really put meaning into them, right? What does this spike mean? What does this code mean? What is it really doing in the, in, in the construct of what the brain is? Um, and, you know, this has become a major, um, has, has, has been a long challenge for our, everyone that studies the brain. Um, and one of the issues that has come about is how we use behavior to do this, right? One of the real core functions of the brain is to allow individuals to navigate the world around them. And really in the same way that the main function of say the heart is to pump blood, the main function of the brain is for behavior. Now, classically, the way that we've used behavior to better understand the brain kind of falls into two general categories, right? On the one hand, you have tradition of neuroethology that has used highly specialized behaviors um, to really understand the brain, like the birdsong model is a really great example of this. You know, there's a ton of really elegant work that is that has leveraged this. And then, you know, in behavioral and systems neuroscience, what we tended to do is highly trained and conditioned behaviors um, that were then able to, you know, train an animal on a particular task and read out that information. And while both of these disciplines have been enormously successful, what they also share is a, is a strong limitation that there's been a high emphasis on highly stereotyped behaviors, right? That can be repeated over and over and over again. And in the broader scheme of what animals actually do, these represent a tiny speck of the repertoires of each individual species. And so at the end of the day, what we know is an enormous amount about a very small subset of behaviors. And now we always have an assumption that these behaviors that we've studied generalize to other broader capacities and, and more dynamic behaviors. Um, but that assumption is just that, right? And one of the things that my lab is really interested in is better understanding how different areas of the brain or populations or neurons really change as a function of the context in which they're recorded. Um, so we have a paper that kind of gets into a lot more of these, these details that came out recently. I'm not gonna belabor it for interest in time, um, but just if you're interested in this, I would just point you to that um, to, to dig into this a little bit more deeply. Now, one of the reasons that this has been really interesting to us um, comes from a study that we recently finished. Um, and the idea for this study was to really ask, well, if neurons are responsive, independent of the behavior of the animal, then if we present the same exact stimulus to the same neurons, then we should get the same response irrespective of what the animal is doing, right? So in our experiment, what we did is that we presented vocalizations um, while monkeys were restrained, freely moving, or naturally communicating. What differed between these contexts um, is that in the restraint condition, what we did is we presented vocalizations in kind of the more, most traditional way where you have you know, a, a battery of, of, of calls that are presented in a stereotype temporal pattern um, with a fixed uh, inner stimulus interval. We then presented the same type of stimuli when the animals were freely moving, right? So the only difference between these two contexts is that in one, the animal is restrained and passively listening. In the other, the animal is passively listening but freely moving. What we then did in our communication context was that we engaged the animals with the same vocalizations and the natural conversations, right? So here, what it does is that in both the natural communication and the freely moving condition, the animals are, are moving around freely and they're, they're, they're able to navigate where they want. But in the communication, the timing of the stimulus is more interactive in nature, right? So in these experiments, we use a virtual monkey to engage the animal in the natural conversations. But what across all of these conditions, what we essentially did is that we were presenting the same neuron, the same exact stimuli across three different contexts. Um, and the assumption being that this is a natural vocalization and much work has been done when animals are head fixed. Um, and the assumption being that this is a neural basis of the communication network. Um, and this is in prefrontal cortex. Uh, so other areas of the brain may be somewhat different, but mostly what we found is that the responses of neurons in one context 
was totally non-predictive of what the same neuron would do when hearing the same stimulus in the other context, right? So what I'm showing on the right are just is one example or three different example neurons. The one on the right is one that was driven only in the communication context. The one in the middle is driven in the restraint and freely, but not the communication context. And then we also had a subset of neurons that were responsive across all three. Um, we had neurons that responded to the vocalizations and all of them, but the main point was that neural responses and what has been traditionally the way that we approach the understanding the neural basis of communication really wasn't predictive of how the same neuron would perform when the animals were naturally communicating, when they were actually engaged in communication. Um, now, prefrontal cortex, of course, is an area we all know is highly susceptible to behavioral nuances and contextual differences. Um, so, you know, we would need to extend this to other areas of the brain, but um, this at least got us really thinking much more deeply about, well, how does this relate to other areas of the brain and other processes? Now, in my, in my lab, we, we sort of have broadened our understanding of, or we've sought to un understand the brain by really expanding the um, behavioral uh, toolkit that we're really using to understand this, right? So a lot of the work in my lab has focused on communication, like the study that I just told you about. Um, we've also started um, looking at spatial navigation and exploration. This work is more centered in sort of hippocampus and entorhinal cortex. Um, we're starting new work on circadian rhythms. Um, and then the topic that I'm going to talk to you about is vision. Um, but really, the heart of the lab um, is really about how the primate social brain works, right? To me, all of these other systems are really in service to what primates do really well, right? Like I always like to say, the only thing that we really do well is, you know, lie and cheat and form alliances and have friendships because we're not really that fast. We're not really that strong. You know, our sensory systems are pretty average for vertebrates. Um, but we excel in the social domain. So my interest in navigation and vision and circadian rhythms really is about as a, as a step to how do these systems really function in the social world. Um, so, you know, as Wienerich really elegantly laid out, um, you know, much of what we know about primate vision comes from studies in which animals are head restrained and, um, you know, presented with various stimulus. And this has been enormously su su successful. Um, you know, Wienerich's done just elegant work in, in face processing and all of these various social systems. Um, you know, and many others have done this. And, you know, it's not, and, and we do this as well, right? We have papers with head fixed animals. Um, much of our work focuses on more freely moving and natural contexts, um, but this is not, this is something that we routinely employ in our own lab. Um, but if we think about vision, so, I, you know, for me, I've, I've largely kind of avoided the study of vision um, in primates for a long time for, for various reasons. My interest has mostly been in more natural behaviors, and it's been really hard to find natural behaviors that would be that we could use in a way to really understand the visual system. And, and um, so, you know, this, this more recent work that, that we've been doing really comes on the idea that the way that we have largely studied vision is as a passive process, right? Animals and humans are presented with stimuli and they may be using a task, um, but this is not really the way that we, our visual system works, right? We are active navigators of the world. We don't just see you know, a cup or a ball. We move towards it, we move around it. We take in information from multiple perspectives and that active drive to accumulate information has not really been something that we've been able to capture in primates and, and both human and non-human um, for a number of reasons. And so part of what I wanna, really what I wanna tell you about today are a couple of things that we've been doing to, to make strides toward this, um, to better understand the neural basis of natural vision in the primate brain. Um, so what got me really excited about this was a number of years ago. So in addition to the work that we do in the lab, um, we do work with marmosets down in our field site in Brazil. Um, and I was down there watching them uh, for doing it. We were actually piloting a different experiment, but they happen to be really, they, they happen to be in a period of there's some rain and so there are lots of insects. Um, and so what I was doing is watching the marmosets just hunt um, these, these various insects. And so what I want to do is show you one video. I know for seeing these can be a little bit jumpy, so hopefully this comes out okay. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of walk you through what really excited me about this. Um, so this animal is slowly stalking a dragonfly. It moves very slowly because if they move quickly at a dragonfly, the dragonflies fly away, right? But what's really interesting about this is not that there's, a, there's not only that there's this whole perspective taking, but the animal is, is 
you know, does this head cock, which might be visual parallax. Um, and, you know, what, what, what really amazed me about this behavior was virtually everything that has been studied in the visual system is illustrated in these few seconds, right? Everything from, you know, object recognition and decision-making and planning and attentional control and sensory motor feedback, all of these things that have been studied in isolation happen in a single pre-capture um, behavior. So what we did, um, this is one of the only studies we could actually do over during, you know, a lot of the COVID time because our, my lab was, 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 was largely shut down for a while. Um, but I had students uh, with my collaborators in Brazil, they were able to go out to the field site, which was incredibly socially isolated, um, and record hundreds and hundreds of videos of the animals hunting. Um, and so what we wanted to do was to take that, this behavior as a first step to really understanding it. Prey capture is a really dynamic behavior, and it's been used in a lot of different species really well. Um, what's really amazing to me about the marmots of prey capture is the way they navigate that three-dimensional space. So this project was led by Victoria Ngo and Julia Gorman, um, and it was sort of a multi-step process. I'll, I'll run through this quickly since um, we're, we're you know, running low on time. Um, and this is all done with my collaborators, Nikki Shiel and Antonio Soto down in Brazil. So the first phase of this <laughs> was to take um, the, I know 300 or so videos that we had and sort of organize them into different, um, general patterns of how they approach prey capture. A lot of this was driven by the prey itself and the way that they would, would um, pursue it. Um, so we came up with basically three general categories. So there's the mouth capture. So this is shown at the top here. <coughs> and this is largely done for small insects that are walking in a row like ants, right? So they do, they find a line of ants, they go down. And they just kind of pluck these with their mouth. They don't use their hands very often. Um, it's more efficient to use their mouth. There's the stalk, pause, and lunge. So that was the video that I had shown you before that they would spot, identify um, their prey, and then they would move into position. They'd often have a pause, and then they would have a ballistic grasp to lunge towards it. Um, and then the last category of this was the capture and flight. So they were really good at capturing three flying insects. So this is really challenging, right? Because you have a very fast, rapidly moving insect <clears throat> that's that's moving around in three-dimensional space. Um, let me show you this, this short clip uh, that illustrates this. <coughs> so often there'd be multiple bugs flying around. Um, they would they would sort of focus on one and then they would grab it. Usually it was a two-handed grab. They were much more successful with two hands than with one hand. Um, and you know, this this is uh, you know they would they would often get into position like this high up in the branches and they would catch multiple of these fly insects. Um, so just to kind of I want to skip over this a little bit, but I just wanted to mention the marmosets were amazing in these behaviors, right? So they were going upside down in branches, uh, you know, inverted in all these positions. So this is a highly variable behavior. So it's a very natural behavior in the classic ethological traditions and neuroethological traditions, but it's not stereotyped at all. And this is because they had to be very creative. Insects are found in all sorts of areas of the substrates and precarious positions. They'd use real, sometimes they would see a bug and they would, it would take them three or four times of attempting to get into a position where they could actually grab it because if they mistimed it, then they're going to fall, you know, 20, 20 meters to the floor of the forest and, and hurt themselves. Um, they would capture the capture them on horizontal branches, on vertical substrates. So these polar plots are just showing the, the extent of the body, um, that it would they would reach out often with just their hind legs grabbing onto the substrate um, in different directions. Um, you know, you can this paper just came out actually is in print this week um, uh, or earlier at the end of last week, I think. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can read a little bit more about that if you're interested. Um, but what we really wanted to do was also to apply modern tools to being able to quantify behavior. So a lot of these great technologies like Deep Lab Cut, um, we use sleep instead. Um, one of the really nice things that they do for us that has been done really well in the lab is to quantify behavior at the time scale that brains really happen, right? So you can have lots of biomechanical movements and taking measurements at millisecond time scales like you can really co-vary with brains. Um, so this is just a video um, of one of these models. So, you know, you train uh, uh, the, a model on a subset of the videos and then um, 
you apply it to the rest. And these were really good. We were, we were actually quite surprised these would work in the field because you can see from this video, the size of the animal is changing. The perspective is changing. There's clutter around them. Um, you know, there it was actually surprising that it worked so well. Um, but we were able to do this for at least a handful of the videos. One of the challenges with the most of our analysis focused on the free flying um, insects and it was hard to have the insect and the monkey in uh, focus because this is just a handheld camera. Uh, and so there are only a handful of these that we could actually do. But I'll, I'll just kind of run through a few things that we found really interesting. Um, so one was the relationship between bugs move, the insect, the praise movements and the head and gaze direction. Um, and so this plot you see on, on the left here is just showing you know, the model and then we're projecting out where the gaze is um, over the last, you know, over about a, a, a 500 milliseconds of that into the right, there's the actual tracing of the head and the bug movements. Um, one thing that we really found is that the head and prey movements were not well coordinated until about the last thousand to fifteen hundred milliseconds, and then you saw this very rapid increase in correlation. But what we also noticed is that their velocity of the head increased very rapidly right before capture. And we think what was going on is that the the when the animals are flying around they actually capture them, not when they're kind of hovering and zigzagging very quickly, but when they're in long flight. So the animal, the bug, the insect is flying. Once it goes on a trajectory, the head moves in coordination with the, the insect and that's when they do their ballistic grasp. Um, on the other side of this, we also looked at how the hands worked in coordination. So, you know, these are free flying insects and so they're making movements. And so one possibility is that, the, the you know, they're, predicting where the insect is going to be, and they're just going to reach out very quickly and grab it. Um, and so what I'm showing here on the on the, on the the panel with the, the video skip, these are still grabs again, that just show the, the, um, the tracking of the hands over that period of time. And to the right is just those hands at each time point. Um, and up in this area to the top right, is the full set. And what you now see in that full movement is not just where the hands actually moved, but what would be the opt optimal trajectory. And what you can see is these deviate quite a bit from what the optimal tra optimal trajectory is. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, make a few comments on this. So they mean multiple direction changes. Um, it was uh, tortuosity if we, we do this analysis. So this is essentially a way of, of measuring the distance um, in a non-smooth surface. Um, these were, mo all of the hand movements were significantly greater than the, what would essentially be the optimal trajectory. They were, the, they're reaching peak velocity very quickly. And the whole mean duration of this is only about 400 milliseconds, you know, or so. So what was amazing is that they're making multiple movements from the time that they reach out to capture this insect. And the only way they can be doing this is with vi visually guided feedback. And this is happening very, very quickly. Um, so that's one of the things that we found to be really impressive about this. So, you know, and, and the behavior is really exciting. We're, we're sort of replicating this in the lab, um, which is a little, has its own nuanced challenges. Um, but, you know, again, this is a really dynamic, natural visual behavior, and that's what interests us. There's visual feedback, there's, a, there's attentional control. All of this is caked into this really, really amazing and dynamic behavior. Um, but one of the problems with this, and this has really been the bottleneck for primary vision is, the eyes, right? In this, we're unable to track the eyes. We can project gaze, but as we've learned, this is really a poor estimate. Um, so what has really been a problem for understanding natural vision in primates is our inability to track where animals are really looking. So I have an amazing postdoc for Grimpal Singh um, and another postdoc that's been helping with this, Jingman Lee, and they developed a system that um, Vikram likes to call Cerebro. And you can see here, this is a really awkward name, um, but he really likes the name and uh, you know, it's just amazing um, what he's done. So what he's essentially developed is a head mounted eye tracking system for marmosets um, that involves a few different pieces. So the basic initial design of this is similar to what people have done in mice, um, where what you have is you have a world camera that's facing out ahead of the animal, and then you have another camera um, that is tracking where the eye position is. But because we need this to be fully freely moving, whereas most of the mouse um, systems like this are tethered, what Vikram had to create a backpack that is two microprocessors. So what I'm showing here on the right is actually an early version of this. Um, so we've tried initially with the Raspberry Pi Zeros, their timing is not good because you have to sync each of the cameras is on a different um, 
a uh, different processor. Um, so we ended up using these SM SMT32 boards. Um, we had to redesign them because they were a little long. So this one you can see on the right here is the original one. Uh, the ones on the left are the redesigned PCBs for this. Um, and this is what it looks like, the old version on an animal. Um, and right here you see is just uh, kind of still uh, grabs of, you know, what the world camera is seeing, the eye camera, and, um, you know, just a, another picture. So they, you know, they adapted this, most of the animals after some period of, you know, not too long, they don't really bother with the hot mirror. Um, and that's been a really nice surprise. Um, one other part that Vikram had to work on was actually capturing the eye. Um, so when they have really good light, it's fine to use kind of traditional ways, but an animal is freely moving or the pupils changing and the lighting on the eye is changing quite a bit. He developed a, a artificial neural network that does the eye tracking and it captures this incredibly precisely over a long period of time. Um, and this is a really nice uh, contribution that he's had uh, as well to the development of the system. Now, when we put an animal in a, in a um, head holder and we have one eye using a standard eye tracking system and one with our Cerebro system, we find that they essentially are, are very closely correlated, capturing most of the eye movements. This is older data. We've actually um, are working on rewriting the driver code so that we can increase the frame rate. So this is at about 60 to 70 frames a second. Uh, once we have this code finally debugged, we should be in about 100 to 120 to 150 frames a second, which will allow us to capture the micro saccades. But even with only 60 to 70 um, frames a second, we're getting all the normal eye movements um, that you would get on a, on a, on a standard um, system that everybody, most people are using. Um, now, I'm just going to show you this video of the eye tracking system. So just to bring you um, some uh, to orient you, so this one in the center, the orange is actually where the eye is. The the um, the yellow uh, 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 plus sign in the center is the projected gaze. So what you'll see is how far, how bad gaze direction is for predicting where an animal is looking. You'll have the raw eye data up on the left, the, um, the neural net that's tracking eye position, some intensity and gaze offset. So this is how far the eye is from where the gaze is predicted. Um, these are neurons actually recorded in V1, and then the head position is where the animal is moving through space. Um, so I can show you this. Um, and you know, this is these are data in V1. You know, not to tip our hand, we, we started recording in this. Uh, you know, uh, what, I, what it probably is unsurprising to say V1 is not just driven by orientation. Um, and there may be a difference uh, between locomotion, which has been a modulator in rodent systems. Um, and, and sort of head movements for exploration as having different effects on uh, mo sort of motor feedback modulation in the, in, the, in the visual system. But this is something we're still working on. This is Jingwen Li. Um, this, is, this is really her project with V1. Um, so I'm just gonna, uh, in the interest of time, just kind of wrap it up there. Um, and what I wanted to just really emphasize is, you know, we, you know, when we think about natural behavior in the visual system, it's, it's been really hard to do this. Um, and, you know, we've really studied vision in a single context and it's been really great. And it's not that that context is likely to be incorrect. It's just probably in every area of the brain is, is going to be different. It's not capturing everything that that structure is doing, right? When an animal actively navigates through the world, which is really one of the most basic evolutionary pressures on every species is to be able to move through the world. And sensory systems are a huge part of that because if you're moving, you need feedback about what's around you, whether this is through audition or vision, whatever sensory system you need. Um, and I think what excites us is that we now, with this behavior and this new eye tracking is to really be able to kind of get to the next step to really understand how the visual system is really operating in these kinds of natural behaviors. Um, so I'll just leave it there and thank the students in my lab and, you know, of course, all the funding agencies that, that keep the lights on. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Corey. Thank you for sharing the state of our technique. So questions from the audience in the Zoom meeting room or from the live streaming platform? Okay, hey, Corey, a uh, very, very interesting talk and uh, uh, work. And I just read your paper, that current biology paper, and I got a little question. Uh, how can uh, how can we understand the results of PCA of behavior data? I, I think uh, or... I, 
Yeah, I seen the paper, uh, the figure four. Uh, I got a PCE four. for behavior data and a PCE for the neural data. And how can I understand or oh, get the meaning okay. of the PCE of the behavior data? Really interesting yeah. about that. So, so you're talking about the um the review paper, right? Yeah. So, so that yeah. that's not that that's not real data. That's an illustration, right? So the the point of that is to say. And probably PCA is not going to be what you would use. You'd probably use something far more complicated like the GLM or even you know any of the machine learning. I think mm -hmm. the, the real point of that was to make the case that if you want to understand what that population is doing, what we were trying to emphasize is this idea of behavioral tuning, right? In the same way that if you want a sensory tuner neuron, where you would take you know, a bunch of different stimuli and you'd ask, what is the response profile, right? If you want to understand what that population or what that neuron is doing, um, and probably it's much more of a population code is, you would need to have a battery of behavioral context in which you're testing, right? And by doing that, what you would end up being able to extract is, you know, this is what that population's computational role is in a lot of things, right? In the same way that you know, we all know like a single neuron doesn't do a single thing, right? And that that's yeah. one end of the spectrum. The other end is is sort of this mixed selectivity, right? But but the, in the same way that a single neuron doesn't do only one thing, a single neuron doesn't do everything, right? Like we know there are circuits and cell types and all that, right? So the question is, and th this is really to me like one of the big questions for the next phase of neuroscience: What are the principles that govern what each structure, each population is able to do, right? What are the limitations? You know, what is true of a CA1 hippocampal neuron is not going to be true of a pyramidal cell in, in visual cortex, right? And so what are the what how do you understand what the range is al along which those can operate? Um, and so that 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 is really a schematic rather than real data, um, just to kind of make that point, right? So as you bring in context, what you'll get out are you know coefficients or you know, depending on what the you know analysis you use. Um, you know, to help you understand how, what is it doing, you know, what is, how far can you stretch it in this direction, what is it limited, you know, and, and so forth, yeah. Okay, thank you, it's a very fascinating idea. Thank you very much, thank you. Well, well Rick, I saw you raised your hand. Well, Rick, do you have any question? No, I was just uh, congratulating uh... <laughs> Corey on uh, on the talk and uh, and then the work. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually I should have followed probably given a talk that followed up on some of your stuff. We we have data related to some of the the things you were talking about, but you know, next time. Yeah. Students in the meeting room, more questions. Okay, if no more questions, Corey, thank you very much. Thank you. So. Our next speaker is Professor Tang Shiming from P Peking University. Shiming studied mechanical and electronic engineering during his undergraduate and, and PhD studies, but his enthusiasm has been in neuroscience. His, his research team has de develop, developed the most advanced two photon imaging tech, techniques in awake monkeys and has done a lot of beautiful work on VR protocol processing. The title of his talk is A, a Data-Driven Approach in Study Macaque Viral Cortex. Welcome, Shimi. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, share your screen. I will, I will share my screen. Okay, let's start from the first slide. Okay, uh, thanks, Uli, and uh, thanks all speakers. Yes, Hello. everything is okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Mm -hmm. I'm Shimin Tang from uh, Peking University Hello. and uh, CRS uh, Life Science Center and the uh, PK Nagawa uh, Institute. So, in this talk, I will uh, present our recent uh, unpublished uh, works on Makaka uh, visual neural coding uh, in uh, natural imaging vision. So let's uh, uh, start from uh, a problem we found uh, in nearly 10 years ago in V1 neural coding. Uh, uh, you, you can see uh, at that time we developed the two photon imaging in a weak macaque monkey. So we use this uh, uh, method to 
is the V1 neural response to which are a, a stimuli. So if you use a, a orientation bar, or, oriented bar, or greeting, you can uh, find the V1 neural uh, respond very well to orientation uh, bars or greeting, and you can even get a less uh, uh, orientation mass. However, uh, when you uh, check the uh, V1 neural response with um, a much bigger uh, uh, stimulation uh, sets, for example, you some complex chip, you will find many neurons respond much stronger than uh, orientation bar. For example, this neuron, you can say there is some orientation uh, tuning uh, for orientation bar. Uh, it's preferent to uh, some bar, but uh, if you test the neuron with uh, a curve, you can see the, the neuron is found much, much stronger for a curve. So this may be a problem uh, in the understanding of V1 neuron code. So there is some other example. Uh, for example, this neuron preferring a uh, cross uh, rather than uh, orientation bus. Even for some uh, typical orientation uh, neuron, for example, this neuron uh, is very rare to orientate the bar, but uh, there is also some strange behavior when the uh, monkey see some complex uh, shape. It cannot be explained by the orientation uh, tuning. So uh, why uh, there is a problem in uh, this uh, traditional uh, study? So tra traditional study uh, follow this uh, so called the uh, hierarchy of uh, which or which pathway. So they use the uh, simple stimuli, for example, the bus operating uh, to study V1 and use some simple shape in studying V4. But uh, this limited uh, uh, small number of uh, pre selected uh, uh, which stimuli may bias our understanding of which code. So uh, if we want to get a uh, uh, a full picture of which are neural code. Maybe we can, uh, we, sh we should examine the which are neural response for a large number of uh, natural uh, images. So we uh, proposed a data driven study on macaque visual cortex. So first we will uh, record the neural uh, response to a large number of uh, natural uh, image. Uh, to get the big data. So this uh, require a long-term stable neural active recording method. And then we also need an uh, open set of images. We randomly uh, pick uh, uh, images from ImageNet. So it's a very open set, not a pretty selective. So uh, the second step is more important. We have to analyze the big data to uh, find the neural code rules. So this uh, needs uh, some uh, machine learning method, for example, DNA modeling. And uh, we can uh, perform predication of neural response uh, or feature uh, visualization. So today I will uh, present uh, two examples. One example is uh, from single cell network study in V1. So uh, this is uh, uh, a uh, instruction of long-term stable two-point imaging of weak macaque monkey. So we can see quite many neurons uh, in our uh, uh, FOA to hold on. And uh, this uh, recording can be very long-term stable. So we have a chance to check many, many uh, visual stimuli uh, when uh, macaque keep fixation. So this is an uh, example of big data of macaque uh, visual neural response to nature stimuli, which I uh, presented uh, secondly, uh, uh, many natural imaging to the macaque monkey, and then we can get a uh, uh, many neurons response to the uh, visual stimuli. Uh, in some uh, example, we can get more than uh, 40,000 uh, natural images during one week's recording period. So this is two examples in our big data. For example, this neuron, you can say uh, the most likely uh, some uh, grid, you can say it's all grid, Great can uh, active this neural very strong, but uh, not the orientation bar or orientation grating. So this is another example of neuron. This neuron may be like a color. So there is always some color in the preference uh, uh, stimulus. 
you can see the total number of the, the nature imaging is uh, 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 50,000 uh, uh, nature imaging. So it's a uh, uh, very big data. Yeah. And we uh, can use uh, some linear analysis uh, to get the overall uh, 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 property of these neurons. For example, this neuron, we just uh, uh, summary all the uh, uh, strong response uh, uh, pictures. Uh, and we use uh, uh, the which the uh, summary. Uh, so, so we get a uh, uh, get a research field uh, of the nature image. So it's a cover. This is a, a grid. Like, so we we get a kind of many uh, complex patterns uh, for many neurons. So uh, in the next step, we try non-linear analyze. That is some machine learning uh, analyze on uh, V1 neuron big data. So uh, this is uh, performed by Tian Yi Wang and uh, Xie Jie uh, on this work. So we build, uh, first we build a linear readout uh, uh, network to predicate the response of which uh, V1 neurons. And then we also try to uh, directly training the CNN uh, with the big data. So we can get a quite high uh, 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 correlation uh, predication uh, uh, presence. Uh, it's about uh, 0.76 uh, 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 in predication. So we uh, next we next step we uh, use uh, uh, we perform a feature visualization. So we uh, start from uh, random noise uh, imaging and then to find the uh, the, the best uh, uh, imaging to make the make one neuron a strong response. So we can get uh, uh, the uh, features uh, the the features which is strongly active neuron. For each neuron, for example, this neuron is a typical uh, carbon filter neuron. So this neuron likes some uh, teeth. Uh, this neuron is very strange. Look like uh, eyes. This is look look eye. And this neuron is a cover uh, uh, facial neuron. This is also cover. This is some uh, spots. So. Uh, this is not the first time we found uh, uh, su such a uh, very special, uh, very selective uh, neuron in V1. Uh, so we also uh, found some other neuron uh, uh, like uh, uh, eye cell in uh, V1. For example, this neuron only respond to some nature imaging with uh, eyes. So we check the uh, uh, respond with, with some some shifts. For example, for uh, it's respond very strong to uh, eyes. But if we uh, separate it to components, it's not respond very well. It also have some uh, invariants, side invariants. So this is another, another extremely sparse V1 neuron. Uh, so then it respond to uh, lips like a picture. For example, this neuron only respond to one from uh, 5,000 uh, uh, image. So this is very special. So. We think uh, a V1 neuron is uh, uh, sparsely putting uh, some complex shift in natural imaging rather than uh, orientation tuning. Mm -hmm. So to confirm is not, uh, uh, this sparse response is not, uh, uh, or not an artifact uh, from, uh, for example, causal imaging. So uh, we check the uh, relationship between causal imaging and the strike active. We can get a very linear relationship between these two signals. We also directly check the uh, spaces of uh, visual neuron uh, with a uh, uh, really single uh, unit recording method, for example, loose patch recording. You can get also very really, uh, sparse uh, response uh, uh, for visual neurons. So this is a summary for uh, example one. So we get a big data of the visual neuron response to this image. And uh, we perform the uh, analyze on the big, big data and uh, can uh, uh, conclude we want neuron is fastly encoding uh, complex features in uh, nature imaging. So uh, another example is uh, uh, it's about uh, a population level study in V4. 
Uh, so this time we use long term stable large field cost imaging with Makaga Mountain. So we use uh, uh, intermittent uh, uh, parallel uh, uh, exposure uh, uh, to get a long term stable uh, 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 one photo uh, recording on Makaga Mountain. So this is a V4. So when uh, the monkey see the see your face, there is a full or a three uh, patch active study. So uh, why we start from uh, we four, not we one. So this is uh, because we one have very less uh, orientation uh, orientation partner uh, organized very well, but uh, we one have a lot very uh, well organized for high order. Uh, selective neurons. For example, this neuron and uh, this neuron is uh, nearby neuron is close to each other, but uh, this neuron like uh, colors, this neuron like uh, 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 grids. So we will have low uh, well switch organization for high order neurons at all. So we start from V4. So we checked the uh, repeatable uh, uh, of the we for uh, cortical response for uh, national images. So the single cell response very well, and the signal noise ratio is very high. And uh, uh, it's also respond across days. Mm -hmm. So uh, in one week, uh, uh, in one week uh, of five days recording period, we can get a big data of we for uh, cortical response. It contains uh, training data set and uh, validation data set. Uh, for uh, check the uh, DNA model, and I also check a uh, uh, set for uh, check the repeated ability uh, uh, across space. So we build a DNA model to predict the new response. Uh, the detail is a little bit complex, so I, I will jump. And uh, finally, we get a, a very high uh, predict. Uh, 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 model, model uh, for this uh, big data. And then we use this this uh, model. Uh, we predict the uh, preference uh, image, natural image for each picture. So we get a map for, for preference uh, map in V4. So you can see, uh, for example, this, uh, uh, this uh, area may be uh, preference some color, uh, uh, color feature. And this uh, area uh, preference some face uh, 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 face uh, image. So there is uh, some traditional uh, patch. For example, this uh, uh, is uh, orientation uh, orientation uh, canon uh, in V four. But uh, there is also some other interesting uh, patch. For example, this is some uh, curvature uh, patch. There is a uh, face patch. And there is some uh, fancy uh, sports. Uh, this work is also uh, performed by Tian Yiwang and also, uh, also Yao Qian. Mm. So we can check uh, there is some very interesting uh, uh, patches. So this, uh, uh, this area is uh, selected for color uh, stimulation. Maybe it contains some color patches. This uh, is orientation patch uh, for horizontal uh, orientation, but uh, it's also preference uh, uh, maps. This is uh, also interesting. It's uh, selected to some uh, flows and also uh, the open mouth. So it's very interesting. This is a uh, typical face patch. All these uh, uh, pictures uh, uh, preference face and selectively respond face. This is a curvature uh, patch. This is also a patch uh, for uh, face. This is uh, some sports patch. This is a, a density sports patch. So uh, I I want to mention this uh, map is a uh, model predicated uh, map. It's not a really map. So we uh, want to verify the map with uh, really uh, cortical response. So we use uh, some face for uh, show it show to the monkey. So we get uh, just the same patch uh, active sony. So uh, we also use uh, a color stimuli uh, to uh, show it to the monkey. It's also get the, exactly the same uh, location of the uh, response uh, particle patch. 
So uh, the next step, we uh, identify the uh, practical feature for V4 patch. For example, this patch is a uh, uh, face patch, but we wonder it may be not really uh, identify the whole uh, face. So we use the method, uh, use a so called mask uh, uh, stimuli to get an idea of which part is most important for this uh, neural response. Contribution most uh, in the neuron response, uh, the inhibitory response. So we get our importance map. For this hash, we get the importance map uh, around the uh, lo loss. So we know this uh, may be a loss uh, patch, not really a face patch. So if we uh, only use the loss to uh, show to the monkey, it's also get the very similar uh, cortical axis Q uh, on the V4. But if we uh, mask the loss, the critical part, uh, they actually almost uh, uh, disappear. Mm -hmm. So we know the V4 face patch is not really a uh, face patch. This may be a face component patch. So we get some other uh, uh, critical patch. Here. For example, this is a uh, uh, ice patch maybe uh, from another monkey. So we can uh, get a summary for the second part. Uh, we first we get a big data uh, for V4 cortical response for nature uh, images, and uh, we get a high uh, present uh, predicating uh, DA models uh, from this big data, and we can get a comprehensive V4 function map contain rich features for minds. So. Uh, uh, along this uh, way, uh, this uh, uh, data driving study way, uh, I think we can finally get a, a frame of uh, visual information processing along the winter pathway. So uh, in V4, uh, there is uh, many neurons, especially uh, including local features uh, beyond the uh, orientation or color. And uh, in, but there is no uh, color for this uh, high level feature. But in V4, there is uh, columns, there is modules, function models for, for example, the face element or curvatures or some other with spatial features. And uh, we also uh, began to uh, study IT, use this uh, so-called big data driven uh, study method. So uh, uh, not only we can get the uh, visual neural coding, uh, uh, but we, uh, I think uh, our big data set can also be used to check the different models in uh, this field. And our recent work also indicates the pre uh, training the DNA cannot very uh, well uh, predicate a single neural uh, response in high level. For example, the AIT neuron is difficult to predicate. So, further study will uh, uh, still need to uh, go on. And then uh, over the side, maybe bring new idea in machine learning and uh, bring uh, inspired uh, artificial intelligence. So thank you very much. This is uh, my talk. So any question, please? Thank you, Shumi, for sharing so many eye-opening results. <laughs> thank you. All right, where, where, where are we? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I mostly wanted to congratulate uh, Siming um, to, the, to this beautiful work. Um, maybe for context, I should say that understanding processing hierarchies and like, like really knowing like where features are starting, um, that is something that, that is, is really important. Um, and Siming's work is just really groundbreaking here to um, really show like where the specialization is starting, where it's ending, and with the spatial resolution that is, um, that is necessary here. I wonder, Simin, if you could speculate um, about feed, feed forward versus feedback, something that, that Wuli, I think, might also want to ask you. Mm. <laughs> oh, it's still called to identify the uh, feed forward or feedback. I kind of we can only uh, study the, the code of the uh, single neuron or the particular pictures. So it's still called to identify or describe uh, which part is uh, feed forward or which part is feedback. That is a challenge, yes. Thank you. So, so actually, following Winrich's question, you see all these face patterns in V4, right? 
Yeah, yeah. So when Rick talked about face patches, do you think those, those neurons in, in V4, the signals from those neurons are from feedback actually from IT or? I think it's uh, <clears throat> not really feedback. It's uh, really uh, from V4. Uh, uh, as you say, uh, it's not really a whole face uh, 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 identification. So it's only uh, some uh, face components. So it's, uh, I think it's not a, a feedback from uh, IT. Otherwise, it will be sensitive to the whole face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In this context, maybe quickly, there's this face area PL um, that um, Elias Issa showed was sort of just like an eye selective region. So it shows up in the fMRI as a face area, but if you analyze it more closely, it's mm -hmm. feature selective. And then the latencies there suggest it's feed forward. So I would guess that she means results are basically feed forward. Or some of them. Maybe. Oh, wait. Uh, may I ask a question? Hmm? I see yeah. the, the V4 map is very beautiful. And uh, I wonder if uh, the map is uh, consistent across different monkeys. Uh, so so you, your, your sound is very strange. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, yeah, to, uh, the, the, the V4 map uh, is a V4 map consistent across different uh, monkeys? Oh, yes. Uh, it's quite uh, similar across uh, different monkey, but uh, there is some uh, differences, uh, individual differences, yeah. Mm. There is always have uh, so-called face patch or cover patch. Of course, uh, the counter patch or orientation patch, yeah. Mm. Also, uh, Shiming, actually, hey. for, for V1, actually, have you ever seen any organization of, of those complex feature selective neurons? Or it's just, they just it's distributed like a salt and pepper, no organization at all? Yeah, we uh, try quite many times uh, to try to find some organization, but uh, always false. Uh, you, you, you can say that even the nearby neurons have quite different. Uh, uh, selectivity. So I think uh, I believe there is no there any organization at all. Yeah, this is strange because the uh, orientation uh, organization is very real, so it's so nice. But uh, uh, for high order uh, uh, character, is have no uh, on orientation. It's very strange. It's very interesting. Mm. Okay. okay. Thank you, Shuming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Professor Gu Yong from Institute of Neuroscience, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Dr. Gu obtained his PhD degree in 2002 at the Institute of Biophysics, Chinese Academy of Sciences. He did his postdoc with Dora and Lucky at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Dr. Gu joined the Institute of Neuroscience in 2000, 2011. He is now a senior PI and head of the Laboratory of Spatial Perception. His research interest is multisensory integration for spatial perception. The talk, talk, his talk is a temporal perspective on multisensory heading perception. Welcome, Dr. Gu. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and invitation. Now I'm going to share my screen first. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, start the print. Uh, okay, every okay, I start now. So, uh, um, like the previous uh, lecturer's talk, um, which are uh, focused on uh, the ventral visual pathway, now I'm going to focus more on the dorsal visual pathway, which is the visual motion. So, now today I'm going to talk about to understand neural mechanisms of multisensory heading perception. Uh, but from a temporal perspective. Uh, so uh, heading or set motion perception uh, is the ability to detect the instantaneous direction of our head or whole body uh, in space during navigation. And this is a very critical uh, ability for our daily life. Uh, for example, in nature, the animals need to uh, correctly judge their heading directions in order to catch the prey or, in, uh, or escape from the predator. And in our human world, we also uh, need to precisely judge our heading directions in many ways. For example, during sports, when we drive, uh, when we uh, 
uh, in the sports. And any misleadings may lead to very serious uh, accidents. So uh, precise heading perception requires uh, integration of multiple sensory inputs. And uh, for primates, uh, the visual cue is the most important. Uh, it has been estimated that uh, the primates uh, acquire information from 70 or 80% from the visual. So this is a very important cue. And uh, optic flow, uh, which is that when we navigate uh, in this uh, world and the surrounding objects will generate a radio pattern on our retina. So uh, this is a very important uh, cue for us to judge where, whether we are moving uh, a leftward or rightward. And this concept has already been proposed uh, as early as 1950s uh, by uh, James Gibson. So he used this uh, concept uh, around that time to train uh, the pilots uh, to, uh, uh, for the fighters to increase the successful rate uh, during the land off or takeoff of, of the planes. Okay? So this is a very important cue. On the other hand, uh, the, second, uh, the second most important cue is probably from the vestibular cues. So this cue comes from uh, the, uh, the inside of our peripheral uh, uh, the, the system. Uh, which is uh, very close to the uh, auditory system here. And the vestibular peripheral system is composed of the two parts. One is the otolith part, which detects the linear translation of our whole uh, of our head or body. And the second part is the canal, which detects the rotation of our head. And today in my talk, uh, we are mostly concentrate on this otolith part, which is to detect the linear translation of our head or whole body uh, in a space. And it has been proposed that vestibular cues play a very important role in our balance control and postural control. And in fact, both optic flow and vestibular cues uh, have been uh, illustrated to be very important in path integration during vector-based spatial navigation, uh, as has been illustrated in many previously, uh, previous studies. So today my talk would be, uh, uh, this is the outline of my uh, talk. Uh, so first I'm going to talk about our behavioral paradigm, okay? So we're going to run a multi-sensory heading discrimination task on the macaques. And then we're going to talk about the neural correlates. And then we're going to uh, uh, describe how we manipulate uh, artificially for these neural correlates and then see the, uh, uh, the change in the monkey's behavior uh, performance. Finally, I'm going to uh, have some discussions. Okay. So first part, the, the behavior paradigm. So to start the multi-sensory uh, heading perception in our lab, we built up a virtual reality system uh, as illustrated uh, here. So this uh, virtual reality system has two parts, basically. The first part is a, a, a motion platform, a six degree of freedom motion platform that it can provide the real vestibular input. So it can translate or rotate the animals uh, in, a, in a 3D space. Uh, and then the second part is a, a very large visual display uh, mounted on the motion platform in front of the monkeys. And through computers, we can generate a, a complex optic flow pattern that simulates what uh, we experience, what is projected on our retina uh, during natural navigation. And in, in many cases, we provide optic flow. So during the experiment, we usually provide three stimulus conditions, two unimodal conditions, and one bimodal stimulus conditions. For the two uh, unimodal conditions, one is the vestibular only condition. So in this case, the motion platform is moving while there are no any visual stimulus provided uh, on the visual screen, uh, except a very small little uh, fixation point for maintaining the monkey's eye fixation. Uh, and in the second uh, unimodal condition, the visual only condition, the motion platform is stationary. So there's no real vestibular input, but only the visual optic flow on the screen will simulate uh, the real motion. Finally, in the Q-combined condition, we will provide both visual and vestibular inputs, which are usually concurrent with each other. So the motion platform is moving and the optic flow is provided on the screen to simulate real motion. And the motion profiles of the two uh, modalities, visual and vestibular, they are matched with each other. Uh, so, and in the middle here, this is our uh, the, a snapshot of our experimental setup. So one thing that needs to be noted is that the vestibular system is very unique uh, in our brain, uh, which is that it encodes a very 
are special temporal dynamics. So the peripheral vestibular organs only detects acceleration of our head. So unlike the visual system, it's very sensitive to the constant velocity, but the vestibular system has to detect the varied velocity. Uh, so that's why in our experiment, we provide here, uh, as indicated here, uh, a varied Gaussian velocity profile as indicated by this dash curve here with a corresponding by phasic acceleration profile. Okay, so the vestibular system, uh, especially for this orderly system, it detects the acceleration uh, stimulus. So this is our behavioral paradigm. We train our monkeys to uh, perform a fine heading uh, uh, discrimination task. So here the dashed line indicates the straightforward direction. Okay, and these solid arrows represents the monkey is either moving leftward or rightward relative to straightforward uh, on each trial. And the motion could be defined by either uh, vestibular only, uh, visual only, or combined condition here. And we train the monkeys to judge whether uh, he, the experienced heading direction is to the leftward or rightward in each trial relative to straightforward. And the monkey needs to maintain fixation during this stimulus duration time. At the end of the trial, the monkey needs to make an eye movement, a saccade to either the left target or right target to report whether he's experiencing leftward or rightward motion. And the correct report will lead to a reward of a choice. So it's a reinforcement learning task. So the monkey's performance is quantified using the classical uh, psychometric functions. So here the X axis is the heading direction uh, with a zero indicating straightforward and the negative numbers representing leftward motion and the right numbers, uh, the positive numbers representing the rightward motions, okay? So for vestibular condition, these are real motion directions, so leftward or right real motion directions. Or for the visual condition, it's defined as the simulated real motion directions. So all the motion direction is registered back to the real motion direction, okay? So this is very important to understand our data. And the uh, y-axis is the proportion of the rightward choices. Here you can see a very typical sigmoid function such that uh, for large heading directions deviated from the straightforward, it's very easy for the monkey to judge whether it's a leftward motion or rightward motion, plus minus 20 degree. But for smaller heading directions, it's more difficult and the monkey's begins to make arrows here, okay? So we can fit a cumulative Gaussian function to this psychometric function data and use our one standard deviation of the Gaussian function uh, as the uh, uh, psychophysical threshold, which roughly corresponds to 84% correct rate. So in this case, you can see the monkey can discharge, can discriminate uh, of around four degrees under the vestibular only and the visual only condition. Okay. So now the green curve here shows the performance under the combined condition when both visual and vestibular cues are provided for the monkeys. And we can see that the uh, psychophysical threshold of the monkey is smaller, which means that the monkeys can discriminate smaller heading directions by integrating the vestibular and the visual cues. So the two cues help with, with, with each other. So now we can summarize all of the data in one of monkeys. So here we just take the average of the psychometric thresholds across states. So just now I just show one example data from one day. Now here we just take the average across days. And we can see that the average vestibular uh, threshold and visual threshold, they are kind of similar here, which is about like uh, 3.5 to 4 degrees. But interestingly, if you look at the Q combined condition, you can see it's statistically significantly smaller than either vestibular or visual Q conditions. And suggesting that the monkey can integrate the, uh, the two cues to improve his heading judgments. And interestingly, uh, the improvement is very close to a prediction from the uh, optimal base and Q integration theory. Okay, so it's very close to, to the prediction from this theory. And now this is the data from the other three uh, monkeys. Uh, basically, you can see uh, overall across the animals, they show very similar patterns, suggesting that uh, monkeys similar like human beings, they can integrate the vestibular and visual cues to improve their heading judgments. So with this behavior model at hand, we can now uh, put electrodes in the monkey's brain uh, while the monkey is performing this task to explore its underlying neuron correlates. So now in the uh, second session, I'm going to talk about the underlying uh, possible uh, underlying neuron uh, correlates. And it's divided into two parts. I'm going to first talk about what happened in the sensory and then talk about what happened 
in the sensory motor transformation areas. So a very straightforward idea for uh, to account for this multi-sensory heading perception is uh, what we call here the early integration model. So in this model, uh, we can see that the unisensory cues, the vestibular cue and the visual cue, they are first processed in each individual pathway. For example, the vestibular information is processed in the uh, vestibular pathway uh, through, say, uh, a, a, a central vestibular cortex called PIVC uh, in the lateral sarcus at the uh, uh, posterior part of the lateral sarcus. And the visual uh, information, which is the visual motion information, is processed from the uh, dorsal visual pathway through the area MT uh, and MST. And then they, these two types of information converge onto a, what we call multi sensory area, usually happen in the uh, uh, in the mid stage of our brain. Okay? So here, the two sensory information converge and get integrated before they are further propagated to higher level areas. Uh, those are uh, sensory motor transformation areas, usually decision making related areas for uh, decision making and motor uh, output. So, um, one area uh, that supports this kind of idea is uh, the dorsal part of the media superior temporal. Uh, sulcus, which is briefly called MSTD in the dorsal visual pathway. So it's a downstream area of the uh, well-known visual motion area of MT. So in this area, people have already shown that uh, it contains a very large receptive field. So very suitable for integrate uh, the, uh, the visual motion information in a very large visual field, just like those neurons in IT that it can, can integrate uh, a lot of information uh, from the field such that it can encode a phase, okay? So MSTD, you can imagine something probably like uh, 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 IT or, 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 or B4. And importantly, people show that MSTD neurons not only respond to optical load, uh, visual optic flow cues, but also are sensitive to the vestibular cues. So it's a multi-sensory uh, uh, area, okay? So about two thirds of the neurons are both responding to uh, vestibular and optic flow cues. So it's an idea neuron basis for integrate visual and vestibular cues. So now I'm going to show you two pieces of evidence from one from the spatial perspective and the other is from a temporal perspective may suggest that MSTD may be ideal for this. Now, first of all, I'm going to talk about the special uh, evidence. Now here I show one example neuron in MSTD. Again, the x-axis is uh, the heading direction, zero straightforward and ne negative numbers leftward and positive numbers rightward. So it's the same as when we plot the psychophysical data. Uh, but the y-axis is now the, the neuron responses, spikes per second. Now we can see for this example neuron, uh, the, the blue and the red curve is the vestibular only and visual only condition. Uh, although this heading range is very small, plus minus 10 degree around straightforward, but we can see this single neuron is very nicely tuned to this uh, uh, the uh, self motion or heading uh, direction, okay? And interestingly, uh, they are congruent with each other. So which means that this type of neuron uh, is very suitable for integrate visual and vestibular cues when we navigate in the world, because when we move leftward, they will generate a rightward optic flow on our retina. So this is what we mean by congruency, okay? So, and you can see that uh, when we provide congruent vestibular and visual cues, then this neuron show uh, enhance the neuron responses during the cue combined condition, suggesting this type of neuron is very suitable for multi-sensory uh, heading perception. Indeed, when we constructed a uh, a, a population model, for example, SVM or maximum likelihood estimator, whatever kind of decoder you can use. And then uh, uh, the decoder is performing a task exactly uh, uh, the same as the monkeys. And you can see the decoder's uh, outcome uh, is very similar to the monkey's performance, uh, which is that you can see the decoders uh, judge vestibular and visual uh, heading direction. You can see they are very similar under the unimodal conditions and the Q combined conditions. Uh, the decoder's performance is improved, uh, reflected by the decreased uh, psychophysical threshold and very close to the optimal basin uh, prediction. Okay? So suggesting that if we train the decoder to read out information from this type of MST neuron, that it can uh, generate a behavior very similarly seen in the monkey's behavior.
Now I'm going to provide a second piece of evidence, which is the temporal perspective here. Uh, uh, about the temporal perspective, as I mentioned to you, that the vestibular system is very unique in its complex temporal dynamics. I have told you that the peripheral vestibular system detects the acceleration. Okay, so here the vestibular peripheral organs detects the acceleration such that the vestibular nerve can only encode uh, the acceleration. As you can see, this is the temporal profile. This is the neural response very close to the uh, acceleration profile we provide in the stimulus. But when the vestibular information is further propagated from the peripheral to the central nervous system, uh, it becomes divided, okay? So one way to divide is that uh, for some of the neurons, uh, the information still remains, which is, which is that acceleration temporal dynamics still remains for many neurons, such that the central nervous neurons also has a, uh, is sensitive to this acceleration profile as reflected by its uh, response envelope. But for the other types of neurons, it integrates the vestibular information in the temporal domain such that it, it accumulates the moment uh, uh, acceleration information such that it will generate a velocity uh, temporal pro uh, profile in the end. So there are, in the central nervous system, there are two types of neurons. One encodes acceleration and the other encodes uh, velocity. Actually, there is a continuous distribution between these two, such that many neurons will encode both acceleration and the velocity in, at the same time. So now, now let's see what happened in MSTD. And interestingly, if we look at the temporal dynamics, uh, in MSTD, this from this one example neuron, and we can see that for the visual response, it also follows the velocity profile, okay? So very close to this stretched curve here. This is not surprising because we know that a visual motion channel is uh, sensitive uh, to the uh, velocity uh, profile, which means that the visual motion encodes speed instead of acceleration. So this is the property of our visual uh, system. Uh, but the vestibular channel, you can see that for the MSTD neuron, this is one example neuron, but it represents the population responses also like this. It also looks like the velocity. Okay, so this is good, which means that in MSCD, the vestibular and visual temporal uh, profiles matched with each other. So this is very ideal for the neuron to integrate the two signals, generate and enhance the responses in a two combined condition. So from both spatial and temporal perspective, I have told you that MSDD may look like it's an ideal neural substrate for integrating the multi-sensory vestibular and visual tubes. Now I'm going to show uh, in the next, I'm going to show you something very different from what we understand based on the MSCD study. Now, uh, uh, after I set up my own lab in uh, the Institute of Neuroscience, we begin to wonder what happened in the downstream areas, okay? So particularly in those sensory motor transformation areas, uh, in the posterior parietal cortex, LIP, uh, in the frontal prefrontal cortex, FEF, and in the basal ganglion nucleus, the caudate nucleus here, okay? So unlike the sensory areas, people have shown that in these higher level decision related areas that neurons usually integrate momentary uh, sensory information from upstream such that the neural responses in these areas will gradually increase up or increase down uh, in, a, in a different way according to whether the monkey's upcoming choice is going to be in the preferred direction of this recorded neuron or in the anti-preferred direction of, of this recorded neuron. And this kind of responses could be uh, best described by the drift diffusion model uh, as being uh, described in many uh, studies. So my graduate student, Han Ho, uh, he put electrode in the posterior parietal cortex, uh, the LIP here in the metacortical so visual pathway. And first of all, here we show the neural responses of the LIP in the visual condition. And this is very consistent with what uh, has been reported in previous studies, such that uh, we can see that AIP neurons uh, accumulate the uh, visual motion information as a function of time, such that if the uh, monkey's upcoming choice is in the preferred direction of the recording neurons, you can see these responses are is up uh, gradually. And if it's on the contrary uh, alternative decision direction, you can see the responses are is down as reflected by this dashed curve until at the end when the monkey makes a, a decision about which choice is going to make leftward versus rightward. 
So we can uh, calculate a difference between these two curves, which is uh, depending on the monkey's behavior choice, leftward versus rightward, uh, which is shown by this ranking up activity on the right figure here. So now you can see this rising slope is very uh, aligned with this dash curve, which is the velocity profile. Again, supporting that the visual channel basically process the visual motion speed information instead of acceleration. Now, the interesting part is the vestibular condition. Now we can see that the vestibular uh, information is also accumulated in area uh, AIP. This is the first time we show that in MacTac AIP, it accumulates not only visual information, but some visual, but some information other than the visual uh, modality suggests that, that it accumulates uh, information from sensory modalities. Okay? So you can see this rising slope uh, in the blue curve, the vestibular condition is very similar to the visual uh, uh, curve here. But the different thing is that if we look at this rising slope, it's much earlier compared to the uh, visual curve here, suggesting that AIP actually is accumulating the vestibular acceleration because this rising slope is more aligned with this acceleration profile. You can see the acceleration peak here rather than the uh, velocity peak here. So suggesting that AIP accumulates different vestibular and visual physical quantity. For vestibular, it's, acceler it's acceleration, and for visual, it's speed or velocity. So we, uh, my graduate students, Qi Hao and Lu Xing, they also record the other areas, the front eye field uh, in the frontal cortex. They also found very similar patterns as seen in the area of IP. And uh, Zhen Zhao, he recorded from the corded nucleus in the basal ganglia, and he found very similar patterns, suggesting that integrating vestibular acceleration and visual speed information uh, is a prevalent in, uh, phenomenon across uh, the sensory motor transformation areas in the brain. It's not a coincidence we uh, happen to see in one area. Now with this data from MSCD and the sensory motor areas at hand, now there are two models, alternative models are in front of us. On the left here is what we call the temporal match model represented by area MSTD, which means that the neural integrates are the temporal matched vestibular speed and visual speed information, okay? And on the right here, we call it a temporal unmatched model, which is that the sensory neurons integrate, uh, includes the vestibular acceleration and visual speed information, such that uh, the higher level areas we are generate something as what we saw just now in, in area AIP, RFEF, and the coordinate nucleus. So our question is, uh, which model does the brain employee uh, to perform the multi-sensory heading discrimination task. We don't know because the monkey cannot tell us. And uh, by looking at the behavior, we also don't know whether, whether monkeys, uh, how the monkeys perform this task. So we try to approach, address this issue from uh, one experiment, which is that we are going to temporarily manipulate the temporal offset between these two uh, stimulus input, the vestibular and visual. So the idea is that we are going to introduce a artificial temporal offset in the vestibular and visual input. So in this case, if the monkey has used a temporal match model to perform the task, then during the artificial uh, manipulated conditions, if we artificially delay the visual and vestibular inputs to, in, to create some lag between these two sensory inputs, then that's going to decrease the multisensory inti integration efficiency uh, of the neurons. And in this case, we expect to see that under the manipulated conditions, the monkey's performance would become worse and generated a higher increased uh, 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 psychophysical threshold. And on the contrary, if the monkey has employed a temporal unmatched model by, temper, by artificially manipulating the visual and vestibular cues, there is an opportunity that we can better align the vestibular acceleration peak with the visual speed peak. So in this case, the multisensory integration benefit may be get increased as reflected by the improved performance and decreased psychophysical threshold. So by, by, manip by manipulating these two sensory inputs, uh, we can check the monkey's behavior output and then uh, to tease out which model uh, is true for the monkey. Okay, so my graduate student Chi Hao and Lu Xing performed this uh, experiment. So first of all, here I show the data 
uh, as reflect uh, as shown before, which is that the monkey performed the vestibule only, visual only, and the integration task. But for this integration uh, condition, we haven't introduced any temporal offset between the visual and vestibular uh, inputs. So this is uh, like just in the natural condition uh, I've shown you before. And we can see that the uh, performance is uh, significantly improved compared to the vestibular and the visual condition. Now on the bottom here, I show the other several conditions. For example, for minus 250 and minus 500 stimulus conditions, we artificially adjust the visual stimulus a little bit forward such that the visual speed peak is more aligned with the acceleration uh, with the vestibular acceleration peak, okay? So we can see that under this condition, the monkey's performance is actually getting improved, reflected by this significantly decreased psychophysical threshold. So which means that if, if we move the visual stimulus a little bit forward ahead of the vestibular cues, then the monkey can get his uh, performance improved. But it's not that if we uh, further improve, the, uh, in, uh, further adjust the, the visual cue uh, earlier, it's better. Uh, for example, if we adjust the visual cue too much earlier, 70, uh, 750 milliseconds ahead of vestibular, then it's uh, reversely, uh, which will hurt the monkey's behavior performance as reflected by this uh, re uh, increase the psychophysical threshold. Finally, if we further delay the visual cues, right? So in this case, the uh, visual speed peak and the vestibular acceleration peak is getting further uh, segregated then in this case, the monkey's performance is getting way worse. And this is the data from the second monkey shows a very similar pattern, suggesting this is a, 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 a consistent phenomenon across the animals. So these data suggest that there is an optimal window that we adjust the visual stimulus a little bit forward of the vestibular by 250 to 500 milliseconds that we are best maximally uh, improve the monkey's multisensory integration benefit. So we further ask why under this window, the monkey's performance will get improved. So to do this, we record the uh, neurons in uh, air, air, area, RIP and FEF in the posterior parietal cortex and in the frontal cortex. And we use the facial information to define the upper bound of the information in, each, in one of the areas by asking if a decoder to extract information to perform the heavy distribution task, what's the best performance uh, it could be. So in this case, we can see that under the uh, zero offset condition, uh, which is the natural condition, the enhancement is little compared to the single Q condition uh, reflected by this green curve versus the blue and the red curve here. But when we adjust the visual stimulus a little bit forward the vestibular, remember that the monkey's performance is getting improved. And we can see that in uh, AIP and FEF, you can see the neural responses are the, reflected by uh, facial information is also enhanced uh, during the combined condition compared to either single gill condition. And this improvement is much larger compared to the condition we, uh, when we don't introduce any temporal offset between a visual and vestibular input, suggesting that the neural responses in AIP and FEF may be able to account for the uh, behavior we, we seen uh, just now. Okay, so our conclusion is that by, temp by artificially manipulating the temporal offset between the two sensory stimulus input, we can see the monkey's behavior uh, to exclude the temporal matching model, suggesting that the brain has used a temporal unmatching model to perform the fine heading discrimination task, which is to integrate vestibular and visual cues, okay? So uh, before we want to exclude MSTD, we want to further test uh, our idea. Uh, which is that, you know, the previous talk has been based on neuron correlates. We run the behavior and we record the neural activity. So this is only a correlation between the two, but it's not a causal uh, relationship, right? So to, to further prove that uh, the neuron response drive the behavior, we need to use some causal manipulation methods. And in macaques, uh, currently uh, there are two methods. One is the uh, in activation experiment and the other is the microstimulation experiments has been uh, frequently used by people. Optogenetic tool is also a very powerful cue which has been uh, maturely used in rodents but not so maturely in macaques. So I'm not going to talk about optogenetic tool. So first of all, I'm going to talk about this in activation. 
uh, method, which is very common uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, neuron science study. Uh, the idea is very easy and straightforward. So if you suspect that one area is causally contributing to uh, the monkey's perception or decision making, you just knock down this area by suppressing the neuron activity. For example, you can inject the musimol into one area to suppress the neuron activity as reflected by here, okay? So in this case, you would expect that when you suppress down the neuron activity in this area, if this area causally drive the monkey's behavior, you would expect to see the psychometric function would uh, get flattened compared to the con controlled condition, such that it will test a necessary role. Okay. Um, on the contrary, uh, the microstimulation typically uh, performed by electrical microstimulation, uh, it tests a sufficient role, which is that it uh, de through delivering a very weak current uh, into the area, such that it will activate a small range of the neural activities around the electrical tip, that it will activate a small population with consistent uh, tuning properties. For example, if you activate a group of uh, leftward uh, motion uh, neurons, then you will generate, you, then we will produce and add a leftward motion into the neuron circuit and bias the monkey's perceptual judgments towards more leftward uh, judgments, okay? So if this area is causally contributing to the monkey's perception, and then in this case, you would expect the shift of the psychometric function either leftward or rightward, depending on uh, the neuron, uh, the label line of the neurons that you activate through the uh, electrical current. So uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce some experiments performed uh, by chemical inactivation, musimol inactivation. So in these kind of experiments, we perform, uh, we injected musimol into several areas, uh, including the MSCD, including the uh, vestibular cortex in the lateral sarcus, which is PIVC, and another multisensory area called the VIP in the ventral part of the IPS in the posterior parietal cortex. So previous studies have shown that VIP is also a multisensory area, including robust vestibular information and visual information. So VIP is similar to MSTD in many ways that it may also account for the multisensory heading perception. Uh, so interestingly, we found that after suppressing down these areas individually, we find that only uh, in the vestibular condition, only knocking down PIVC will generate a large effect on the monkey's behavior, such that it will impair the monkey's uh, head determination task if you knock PIVC down in the vestibular condition. But in the visual condition, it's that when you knock down MSTD, that it will generate raise a significant and large effect on the monkey's behavior performance. So this kind of ex inactivation uh, experiment suggests that the, uh, the visual information in MSTD and the vestibular information in PIVC is important for the monkey's uh, task. So now I'm going to uh, talk about the electromicrostimulation to, uh, to, to, to address the uh, sufficient role. So this is one experiment we performed. Uh, we inject a very weak current in MSTD to selectively a population of neurons encoding either left motion or right forward motion. And we see many cases that this, uh, this operation can significantly bias the monkey's decision towards leftward motion or rightward motion perception. And on the right here, we show the population. So the X axis shows the predicted, the expected direction. So the positive numbers means that the monkey's bias direction is in the direction that is consistent with our prediction based on the neurons encoding features. So if, the, if we activate the neurons with a lateral motion, then we expect the monkey's bias towards lateral motion uh, judgment, okay? So this means it's a uh, predicted direction. And you can see that in most of the cases in the visual condition, you can see uh, that the monkey's uh, bias directions is consistent with the coding of the activated uh, neurons, suggesting these neurons sufficiently contribute to the monkey's uh, perceptual uh, judgments, but not in the vestibular condition. You can see most of the cases, they, they, they are very rare cases uh, in the positive uh, direction, and uh, the mean is very close to zero, very unlike to uh, the visual condition, suggesting that the visual cues, but not the vestibular cues in MSCB is important for multisensory heading perception. 
So in another research, uh, my graduate student, uh, Xue Bei Yu, so she uh, examined, used the same technique to examine a number of areas uh, in the brain. So she examined the uh, area MST, MT, and VIP. And very surprisingly, we found that although VIP also shows very robust vestibular and visual cues in this area, and importantly, VIP also shows a very uh, tight functional coupling uh, with the monkey's behavior choice. So, so if you analyze the monkey's choice with the neuron firing uh, on a trial by trial basis, this is what we call choice probability. You can see much higher choice probability in VIP uh, compared to that in MST-MT. However, when we apply electrical microstimulation, we found that only in MT and MST, but not VIP, we show, uh, we see a lot of cases that it drives the monkey's uh, perception towards uh, the direction uh, which is consistent with the uh, uh, neurons that you activated with microstimulation, but not VIP, suggesting that most of the uh, choice related activity we have seen in the sensory cortex is due to a top down uh, feedback signal, but not, to, uh, not due to a bottom up signal. Okay, so finally, we also examine uh, uh, across stimulus type. So in most of the studies before, I have told you that people examine the translation, uh, the linear translation of signals in MST, which is the uh, heading direction, it's a linear translation, okay? But in MST, people have shown that this area also encodes robust rotation signals, okay? About the row around the line of sight relative to the gravity and also the other direct or rotation directions, for example, your rotation uh, in the horizontal plane, which is very, <clears throat> much related with uh, head direction cells in the hippocampus or uh, in the thalamus as uh, illustrated by Jeffrey Tower before. And also, uh, however, whether these rotation signals in MSTD are also causally contribute to monkey's uh, optic flow judgments during the visual navigation, uh, it's unknown. So in this task, my graduate student, uh, Wen Hao, he designed uh, uh, four alternative choice tasks such that he can examine uh, the linear translation and rotation optic flow signals at the same time uh, in a uh, 3D spiral space here. So what he found is that very consistent with the linear heading direction uh, uh, tasks, we found that in a rotation task, these rotational signals can also causally contribute to the monkey's perception such that if you use microstimulation to artificially activate a group of neurons, you can bias the monkey's rotation uh, judgment towards uh, the label line of the activated neurons, suggesting that MSTD is really a very critical area in those of visual pathway that it contributes to uh, optic flow based uh, navigation task. Okay, so the conclusion is that uh, so far for all the causal manipulation experiments that only the vestibular signals in PIVC and visual signals in MSTD uh, is important. So finally, I'm going to show you one or two slides uh, summarizing uh, our conclusion. So based on all of, all of the previous studies, we propose a neuron circuit that mediates the vestibular and visual uh, heading perception, which is that the vestibular is through the PIVC pathway and optic flow is through the uh, dorsal visual pathway and TMST. But the vestibular signals in MSTD may be used for some other functions, not heading direction, but maybe speed perception or distance uh, computation. So finally, we propose that uh, the early integration model and late integration model, we think that we argue that based on our data, we think for heading perception, the late integration model is true, but early integration model may be true for other uh, conditions, other contexts, which may require future studies. So uh, this is our lab. This, uh, we need to thank them for uh, their work. So thank you. This is all my talk today. Thank you, Dr. Gu. We have time for one question. Any questions? Hello, Professor Gu. Yes. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, nice, nice talk. Uh, I wonder, uh, you showed that uh, FEF and LIP and and all the prefrontal cortex showed uh, can uh, explain the the data or uh, the the model can. Uh, so I wonder why uh, there are so many uh, cortex to uh, act to uh, represent the, the signal. 
so what's the function of the LRP and and the FEI? Uh, what's the difference between those those two core texts? Uh, thank you. Okay, so this is a great question, and this is a common question uh, in the neuron science field that people have argued a lot about this because people have observed uh, that there is a highly redundant, uh, redundant information encoded in the brain. So it seems that uh, there is a network in the brain in which the information is highly redundant uh, in the posterior parietal cortex, in the frontal and prefrontal cortex, and in the basal ganglia. Uh, so when you record these areas, you will see very similar patterns during a very simple perceptual decision-making task. And my opinion is that probably this is during a simple perceptual discrimination task because when you provide a stimulus, you judge whether it's leftward or rightward. So it's a two category task, right? It's, it's, it's simple. That's probably why you see very similar patterns across these areas. My thinking is that if you can design some more complex tasks, for example, if you uh, ask the monkey to flexibly switch the task by providing some cue. Maybe in those contexts, more complex contexts, you will begin to see some difference across these areas. Uh, that's my, uh, my thinking, uh, why we see very similar patterns for now, because it's a simple task, but, but they may be responsible for more com com complex um, situations. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gu. Xiao Qing, please. Okay, you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hold my second. So we have um, our panel member here, and uh, I would like to invite, um, you know, we have a five speaker here, and we're also organizer here. And uh, um, I'd like to invite the uh, um, audience to uh, post your questions. For those of you who are on in Zoom, you can just uh, speak, maybe raise your hand if you have a symbol. And others on the uh, live stream, uh, leave, I don't know, uh, I don't see the live stream uh, questions. If you see them, maybe you can um, speak for them. Um, I just suggest, uh, you know, audience ask questions, focus on larger issues, because today we have heard from a five uh, speakers, quite diverse approach and, uh, you know, philosophy. So perhaps some folks are more on larger questions, you know, ask their opinions rather than the um, small detail in the paper. So with that, uh, you know, we'll open the floor, see um, if anyone in the audience has questions for me, for the panel, um, yeah. speakers, anyone. So Li, if there are any questions from a uh, live stream, can you speak? I don't know, maybe sure, sure. you can see, I don't see the questions. If you see any questions, you can pick them up, okay. So maybe um, maybe I will start with one to, to get things going. And the question I wanna ask, um, uh, you know, with the speakers uh, is a more general one. Maybe each of you can take a, a minute or so to answer. The question is the following. And uh, um, the approach we've been taking on uh, studying the primate brain uh, traditional has been largely on operate condition trained behavior, as our last two speakers, Yang Yan and Gu Yong, uh, demonstrated in their work, classic approach. And, but more recently, uh, the work like Corey Miller and Winfrey and others have advocated a natural behavior. I want to hear from each of you your opinion, one way or another, um, the strength and the limitation of each of the approach. And I just want to argue that it encourage you to think of the opposite view. So maybe I will, um, in the spirit of uh, um, discussion, maybe I will ask uh, Winrik to say a few words and uh, Corey, Sumi, and uh, Yong, and uh, Yang Yan. Just, you know, just, I just want to hear your view and uh, I'm sure the audience will appreciate it. So <clears throat> Winfrey. Your turn. Maybe I'm the worst uh, person to start this off because I have uh, sympathies uh, for both approaches. I think that uh, Corey made a very strong case for naturalistic behaviors. Um, part of my undergraduate training is in a newer ethological tradition. Um, and, you know, I think it, it doesn't make any sense to, to study the brain without consideration, you know, what it's for and like the context uh, which it is in. Um, I also think that um, one dimension to consider is 
you know, hypothesis driven versus exploratory research. I think that oftentimes, um, you know, if you have like naturalistic behaviors, you're in a discovery mode, right? You, you might be able to see things that, you know, you wouldn't have seen if you had the more constrained conditions. Uh, the downside I think of that is um, without an analytical component, you know, we might be left in the dark. Um, it could happen that you might discover something and you would say, you know, this is like a very complex phenomenon. And this is going to be very difficult to explain in more traditional concepts, but really proving that this is going to be very difficult. Um, so to me, Siemings talk, you know, today is sort of illustrating the best um, that we can do when you discover something that's very complex, um, you know, like selectivity in upper layer early visual cortex. Uh, and then you're trying to dissect it and really prove, you know, down to patch clamp uh, experiments uh, that are very difficult to do. Uh, really try to prove that, you know, this complexity is real. So I, I can see a benefit um, of naturalistic behaviors. I think there's a necessity for, for naturalistic behaviors. It's the ultimate goal. Uh, I think there is a value for um, discovery uh, and then there are great challenges then, you know, to really uh, get to mechanistic um, insights and, you know, really nail things down. Thanks, Warnick. Um, Corey, maybe you can follow up with this. Some comments, uh, sure. thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think I think I agree with a lot of what being said. You know, I think the, you know, some of the ecological systems like birdsong, you know, progress to the point where they are very hypothesis driven. But a lot of the natural behaviors we're doing in primates, we have a lot of work to get to that point because it just hasn't really been explored, right? I mean, I think my general take on it is, you know, a lot, of, especially in in a lot of primate maybe unspoken views is that like, it's kind of what I call like the Lego model of the brain, right? That the base state is a head fixed animal doing nothing. And then you add a little bit of behavior and a little bit more, and it's a sort of linear summation of complexity. When in reality, they're all just different states that the brain can exist in, right? So I, I don't think you can only do natural behavior, you know, to understand all elements of the brain, you need more controlled and, and more deliberately manipulatable parts of the circuit that can only be done with more precise types of behaviors, right? I think it's more just, you know, in the framing of it, right? I mean, you know, we didn't, we didn't, you know, we can do a DMS task, but that's not the only thing that we can do, just for one example, right? So I think what, what the natural behavior does is it gives you a framework for what is possible within the repertoire, and then targeted experiments can be used to interrogate specific parts of the circuit, you know, within that, rather than maybe how it's been done, which is to take a highly constrained behavior very simply and then generalize it to very complex things, right? I think that's that's kind of not the probably the best way to capture what the brain is doing. But you know, I think I think in the long run, you know, neither is going to help us solve everything. Um, and so there's a there's a complement to them and. I think the further along that we get with the natural behavior, the more targeted and you know detailed our our hypotheses and manipulations can be. So that that's the 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 end goal, I think. But we have quite a lot of work to do in that area. Thanks, Corey. Uh, Samin, do you have uh, some thoughts to share? Yeah. Okay. I think uh, different uh, approach have the benefits. So uh, many years ago, uh, also some people. Suggest me to use uh, three move monkey or uh, use movie to as uh, visual stimuli. But I, I think that for monkey, uh, they still accept the, to stay similar aesthetically and uh, just keep fixation. So for macaque monkey, uh, we still have many uh, research uh, uh, problem uh, just uh, for monkey stay similar aesthetically. So, but for mama set, I heard it's uh, much lower. So, so it's maybe not uh, nice to stay there uh, aesthetically. It's, it's uh, also need to communication. So I think different animal and uh, different uh, scientific problem, uh, you should choose the best uh, approach. But uh, uh, if, uh, for example, if we use uh, move, uh, use move eyes like a uh, uh, study, uh, we, we will have more chance to get new uh this tolerance so i think so okay thank you uh thanks Simi. uh uh go yong um maybe you can share some of your thoughts huh? sure uh so i have thought about this uh for a long time actually 
uh, this is a tough question and I always question my own research uh, because I think my, my research is classical, which could be um, um, uh, tracked back to pupil weasel study, right? So they use this, uh, uh, most of the studies basically can be tracked back to pupil weasel studies where you fix the, uh, the animal's head in any size state or even in a weak uh, state, but you have the head restraint, you control the eye movement and head movement very well in order to catch the receptive field because all of these are based on eye or head centered coordinate so if you don't control them it's going to be very difficult to discover the real neural properties of these single neurons right so on one hand i think this is very necessary and it's enough to if we study some basic properties of our sensory system like if we want to know how we see how we hear how we sense the motion, the peripheral organs or, or some central nervous system. I think this is fine. This is a fine method. But I do agree that this is also double side. If we go to more, you know, higher level perception or even more intelligence related, then maybe this reductionism is not uh, enough. I have argued this, uh, talk a lot this with, uh, with Dora. Um, and uh, in some field, we have to go to the natural way. For example, uh, in our field, if we want to study special navigation, right? If you had restrained these animals, uh, it's very likely that they are going to show very different behavior. And the CA1 place cells or free cells or head direction cells will behave very different, uh, very differently in head strain versus head free um, uh, uh, situations. For example, uh, my previous colleague Mao Dun and uh, Dora and Jilaki, they have a very nice neuron paper last year. Uh, they basically free the macaques in a, in a, in a, in a maze and then uh, ask the monkey to do some uh, navigation tasks, just like the, the, the rats or, or, rod or other rodents. And then they found very different things, you know. Uh, uh, when, you, when, you re when you had restrained the monkeys. So probably, you know, um, I, I totally agree that uh, this is double side, uh, but it's not that one of them is wrong. They, they just fit in different uh, situations, um, at least for now. Uh, probably in the future, when we have more you know, uh, mathematical tools, right? And then allow, allowing us to analyze the, 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 the more complex behavior uh, when there are multiple experimental conditions are provided at the same time, you know, you have more powerful mathematical tools to, to dissociate each of the cube. Maybe you know, uh, in that case, we, we can we can we can address more uh, under the natural conditions. So that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you, Yong. Very nice to say. Um, Yang Yang, maybe you can uh, share some thoughts. Yeah, and I think I can really agree with uh, all the uh, speakers are talking and. Um, also, this is the, the question of the string monkey or free move monkeys. It's also the kind of the, the top questions. I always think about since I I run my kind of the, I'm doing my postdoc training and also setting up my own uh, lab. And uh, I'm thinking about that question, but uh, I think no matter the string monkey or get the monkey free moving, uh, both of them looks like uh, like uh, uh, the two sides of the coin, and they both are just pave the way, pave the way to really understand uh, how the neural mechanisms in like uh, non, at least in non-human uh, primates. And um, restrained monkey maybe can give us very well control. We can kind of limit something, um, which maybe uh, we unknown something and make it a very clear control and we can access the question very specifically or purely. But the freely moving or uh, in the special in Corey just pointed out communication condition, that just the open kind of be, for me, I understand that it's kind of open, a kind of fresh windows. It's added a, a, a lot of freedoms to a more complicated the condition and the monkey will respond to him in a complex fact, the complex context of the behavior. And I think in the near future, we definitely will build up a bridge between both and can just support us to really understand or fully understand maybe uh, the neural mechanisms of how our brain working. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you, Yuan Yi. Bibu, you want to share your thoughts? Uh, actually, <clears throat> uh, the panel members have made a very insightful comment. I just would like to raise another question, actually. Remember, we, we talked about before many times, actually. For, for awake monkey, beha behaving monkey studies, I mean, usually the task is quite, the tasks are quite simple, but in some conditions, people use very complicated tasks. That depends on training for months or even years, like the, the, some people studying PFC. But only after the, after training, you study recording, then you can, you, that definitely you can get some insight into the how the brain works. But it's not a natural condition. That's one thing. Another thing is, Actually, people nowadays talk about uh, the difference between deep neural networks and the brain intelligence. But before I met deep neural networks, network just borrow, borrowed the feed forward hierarchical structure. But that, that, that kind of intelligence are even present under anesthetized condition, like the people, uh, uh, or someone mentioned the Hubo Wizard study, who you mentioned the Hubo Wizard study, right? Even under anesthetized condition, IT neurons can still uh, detect a face, for example. Yeah, but but in the natural condition, I mean, we really know very little about how how the brain intelligence, the, the special for core primates. So the, 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 nowadays, all the if all the knowledge we we, we acquired is just based on very simple behavior protocol protocols. Corey. Studied it. I mean, in his talk, he just showed that I mentioned the state of the art techniques to to to, to, to monitor the behavior, the mammal sets behavior in much more nature environment. I, I think that's the future direction of of, of the non-human primate studies. Otherwise, we just create create some artificial uh, task phenomena and get some artificial effects. Any. Any panel member has um, <laughs> thoughts on uh, the question? I think the question of overtraining an animal uh, is a real one and has been um, I mean, avoided by us as a community as a whole. Because one, on one, one, one side, it's necessary to train animal for you to measure behavior do response. On the other hand, the longer you train, the more you train, the more artificial that behavior becomes, right? So, so it's it's inevitable you have to do so unless, you know, you can do completely free animal instantaneous measurement one trial. But anyway, so so I thought this question uh, Li Wu, uh, you know, brought up is interesting. So, anyone, Corey, you I see you turn your microphone. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I was just going to mention, you know, a lot of what the training does and the continued training, you know, its real role is to reduce variability. Right, it's to make the same the trial as similar as you possibly can, but the brain is a master at dealing with variability, right? So you're eliminating this key dimension of how brain, you know, it's not noise, it's neural computation that all that brain variation and whatever signal you're recording really is. I mean, it's almost like a, a different way of thinking about how to approach it. And I, I forget who mentioned it before, you know, like the mathematical tools that are available now with all the machine learning and all these other approaches. Right. That's how you can, you know, without that, you can't really understand the sources of variance with respect to brain and behavior. But that's, you know, one of the more exciting elements of what's going on in neuroscience. And these, you know, decoders are, you know, five years ago, they were rare. You know, now, you know, they're increasingly complicated. And that's just one part of the toolkit. Right. So I think it's just, you know, we couldn't penetrate the system in the way that that we can now five or 10 years ago. And I think that's part of what's pushing this, this interest in you know, more naturalistic approaches, just having that, that capacity to really interrogate the system and characterize it well. So I, I share Willie's concern about so the artificial nature of you know, what you measure after extensive training. Um, it's one of the arguments why we like to work with social stimuli because they naturally engage you know, the monkey's behavior and we can sort of have a hybrid uh, condition. I, I would like to make the case, though, because no one else might, um, you know, for the, for the opposite viewpoint, I think that if you're interested in, you know, questions of intelligence, for example, um, there would be a case made is that you, you want to push, you know, the behavior to the most difficult that you can in order to show if it's possible, and then try to figure out what the neural basis is. 
Uh, I think I also think there are phenomena where intrinsically, if you want to have an answer, you know, things have to be difficult. You know, if, if you think about decision making and if you want to get to this, you know, an animal reporting its certainty of a prior decision, that that is going to be like a heroic effort to train the animal on doing it. And I think it's the only way to to get to, you know, signals for, for these high level control uh, conditions. So if you think about, you know, visual awareness uh, training, um, you have to train extensively. So I think there's, there's more to it than just reduce uh, variability, but um, that there are questions of intelligence and, and high level cognition uh, that require, you know, very precise uh, behavioral outcomes that in humans you can just instruct and in, in animals you will have to train over long periods of time. Um, I very much uh, agree with uh, when you get that point, because uh, just like humans, if there's no Olympics, we we'll never know a man can run a hundred meter under ten seconds, right? People, nobody ever run that fast. So I think that, uh, that is a very good point that William can make. That if you want to study particular behavior, particularly specifically the the limit of behavior, you you have to uh, train human or animals in particular task towards that direction. So that's actually it's a very good point that William can make. Um, I, I any know, other I don't comment? Know if I agree. I, I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, Go what's ahead. more complicated than thinking about what other people are thinking about what they're thinking about, right? And that's, you know, that's like this. The theory of mind is, you know, that's that's incredibly complicated. And you, you're, I mean, it's not clear that other primates really can do that. But you know, that that pushing that in that way, I'm not even sure that there's a way to train that. Um, and so there are many natural things that are, you know, would would reflect high intelligence and and that, but you it's not something that you're gonna find. I, I agree, not everything is going to be accessible in that way, but it's not the only way to get at that sort of high shelf of what what the animals are capable of doing. Yes, I, I think there's uh, maybe like a distinction. I, I like the sort of the Olympic uh, analogy, and I think this is what what um, uh, what Corey's criticism about. But I think there. That the main thing is it's really behaviors that, that do exist and you need to be, you know, according to just capabilities. And you need to find a way to reveal that they exist and what the neural correlate is. And so it's not that you have to train it because otherwise it wouldn't be there, but you have to train a readout in order to get access to it. And um, so like post-decision wagering and, and um, you know, reports doing rivalry and things like this, they're not about training something that's not naturally there, but to get a readout um, of this complex phenomenon. And the same for um, for theory of mind. I mean, how would you get proof to it? You have to have a paradigm for doing it. And it's going to be very difficult to train because it would be, you know, unnatural for an animal to report on these internal states. But it's absolutely critical, you know, if you want to know that, you know, there is, you know, what level of theory of mind is there. So, um, so, so I'm not saying this is the direction to go. I'm not saying this is the right thing to do in all cases, but I think there are very strong uh, reasons um, that in some cases it is it is the right way to go. Okay, uh, I think this, this is uh, a very good argument. Uh, I think that if we want uh, to uh, understand the intelligence, because the monkey have a lot so high intelligence, so we have to uh, push the monkey to do some intelligent uh, behavior at all. <laughs> Otherwise, this work cannot go on. So, but monkey in the natural life, they do not uh, have to use the uh, top of the intelligence. Uh, even for human beings, we do not have to use our, uh, all our in in intelligence. Only some cases we have to use uh, intelligence, such as in uh, scientific work. So this is the same as uh, the animals. So if we want to study the intelligence from animals, so we have to push the animal to do some difficult task. So that's my opinion. Any any other panel members for this? Further? I would just quickly make make the counterpoint just to confuse everyone to to <laughs> to Siming. I, I think I think that's correct, but you could also make the argument that that you know you need to understand the animal and its natural behavior to know like which problems it is able to solve. And you might discover a form of intelligence doing that that you would miss if you would you know, have a preconceived conception of what intelligence is, and then, then you know, only look for that. 
So, so like in primate ethology, you know, they're, they're interesting examples of what primates naturally do and what they don't do. And with some of you are shocked about like, you know, the limits of the insight into the environment and other cases you are shocked, you know, to see like what they can do that you would not have imagined them, them being able to do. So, um, so I agree, but also disagree. I think I'm sort of the thesis, antithesis, uh, dialectic person here in this, uh, in this discussion. Um, yeah. I want to also mention, aid the, um, go ahead, Kurt. I don't know, go ahead, uh, sorry. Yeah, I want to also aid the sort of counter example for all these arguments is that this is a challenge for us to know as humans, investigators, what animal do, can do, cannot do. The example come from marmosy. So now uh, it is knowing um, that uh, you can train marmosy, give marmosy a piece of uh, iPad, it will play on this. <laughs> But before 20 years ago, before iPad exists, none of us were ever think that animal mar like marmots living in Amazon, it held in the world, they ever touch iPad. But they do. They actually, you give them, they will touch play with this, right? It shows that they have that capacity. But until we have this device, we actually would never know because by all the naturalistic thinking, they would not, the iPad does not exist for us until now, right? So, but this is a good example show that the animal just like us, their brain and that is their whole body has a capacity probably way beyond what we think they can do. Whether you call it natural or non-natural, it depends on seating, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, that's just one, one specific example that, that people in the field know now that, um, that you know, not only uh, Marvin said other animals probably can, can play iPad as well. It's a phenomenon as a, Quite intriguing, in my view. Anyway, that's my thoughts. Corey, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I mean, I think I would say it's sort of what you and Dean were both saying. I mean, in a lot of ways, I think that your example of the iPads or the marmosets is, you know, just about their problem solving and how they approach it, right? And I think a lot of the kind of simple tasks people will say, oh, well, a rat can do it and a monkey can do it and so forth, right? But how they might approach solving a similar problem is very difficult. And some of the paradigms don't give you enough axes to sort of discriminate the species differences, right? So the, the iPad is a great thing because it, it also illustrates, you know, a point that people said about marmosets that you can't train them on certain tasks, but it was more, you can't train a marmoset like a macaque, right? Their approach to these things is somewhat different and they can do it in an iPad kind of a setting where they're not going to be do, you know, a thousand trials in a, in a setting while they're, while they're head fixed with a joystick, right? So you know, I think it, there, there's a lot of latitude there in these kind of paradigms that tease out the way they solve problems and the way they approach it. Um, we don't have that much time, but I do want to take opportunity and uh, ask panel members one more general question. I think a lot of people in the audience, particularly student post that we have, uh, I believe a majority of the audience uh, are young people, younger than speakers and the panel members, student post us. And uh, not all of them work on uh, non-human primates and monkeys, because I always joke for every one monkey person, there are hundred, if not more, mouse person. Okay. So the, the fact that there are hundreds of people listening uh, in our live stream and the dozens of them in here in the Zoom is an interest in the field. Given every speaker today is, um, you know, has been in the field for a while, and I want each of you share with the audience your thoughts on the field of non-human primates neuroscience. Where is it going? What is the future? What do you would do if you are graduate student postdoc today? So it's an open-ended question, but I thought it'd be fun to hear your thoughts on, on this. So maybe um, we'll start with that one, one for again to get out of order. Share your, your look as a crystal ball I just told people, I always ask this question, that what do you, would you do if you're a graduate student today or postdoc today? Okay, Warren, your turn. Um, I think it's, this is a very difficult question. I probably have like a hundred answers and, and maybe a thousand questions myself. Um, I think first of all, that there should be an interest in the question and the, the, the model that you're choosing should be the right model for the question. I think that you know, you might identify yourself as a non-human primate researcher, but I think you should primarily, you know, define yourself as a person interested in a particular question and then choose the right model. I think that 
there's a great future for non-human primate uh, research, you know, for the obvious reasons that it's a, it's a it's a model um, similar to the human brain um, of, of relevance in ways that other models are not. Um, at the same time, it's it's more, much more tractable. Um, and I think that modern technology is, is really giving us very powerful tools, and we've seen this in all the talks uh, today, uh, to really dissect uh, the system and come to mechanistic understanding. I'm at a university where most of my neuroscience colleagues work with much simpler organisms. I'm always impressed, um, you know, my colleagues working with flies, you know, to the level of uh, mechanistic explanation that, they, that they're coming. And I think what I would encourage people to think about is, like, how can we get maybe not to that level, but to similar levels also in non-human primates? And I think there are technologies now available um, that make that possible. They're very difficult to use. To me, Seeming is a, is a hero of doing that. You know, he's pioneered uh, to photon imaging, uh, brought it to an incredible level of quality in, in non-human primates. And I think we need to have more technology development and, and more bring more technologies uh, together. Um, but the benefits of the model, I think they're, they're clear, and I think they're going to become clearer the more we understand the differences of primate brains from, um, you know, from uh, those of... Um, other mammalian or other systems and unique specializations. Um, so that's my 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 quick take. Um, I'll probably have a hundred more if you ask me at a different time of the day. Thanks, Wank. Corey, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think you know, in in a similar vein, right? I think I think one thing that always I, I think people should study more species, right? Like the the mouse monkey kind of thing is, is just not, we, we should be studying, you know, like 10 different species of primates. I mean, that's really how we understand things. Um, but there are resources and time considerations and that. I mean, I think my general, like, philosophy is not to drink your field's Kool-Aid too deeply, right? And understand the difference between truth and dogma, right? Just because a lot of people think that a certain thing is right doesn't actually mean that it's true. Um, you know, you can take examples like, yeah, like Wiener mentioned, you know, the amazing tools to do circuit dissection have been, you know, revolutionary. But, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? So if cells and circuit types are really important for how brains work, which, you know, functionally has been illustrated, you also have to understand the very diff big differences across species and circuits and cell types and, and how these things are organized, right? So you can't, just relabel an area to be like a human and then ignore that there are these big differences, right? You can take your, you know, cutamen and caudate and striatum, right? Like that just doesn't exist in, in, you know, other mammals or, you know, other structures in the brain, right? So glossing over that is not going to help us get there, but it doesn't mean that the work in other organisms isn't really powerful. It's just it's not it's not the same so i think just understanding that comparative point and those limitations you know is is important for for thinking about what you're getting out of the work in the long term like what, what is where is it going to go and what those ceilings are and primate work has lots of ceilings and, and pitfalls as well it's not you know it's going to be true of any kind of species all right uh sounds great and uh Sami, your thoughts advice yeah i think the students uh, uh is, we may still uh work on this field <laughs> as well because primate field is very special and uh, the uh the scientific question and also the technical is uh, very special so i think most of the students are still the researcher uh, in this field but uh, I think this field is uh, really a great field because uh, to understand the intelligence is really a big challenge, and uh, I think in the future it's still a good uh, direction at all. So this is my opinion. Thank you. Thanks to me, uh, Goyo. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is also another top question that I have uh, thought about for, for a long while because I am in an institute that has about 50 PIs. And then the monkey PIs occupies about one fifth and the other majority is the rodents. So we, the, the, the monkey community in our institute always receive a high pressure from, from, from those uh, rodent study because they have very fancy uh, techniques. Um, and then in a published paper in a very you know, frequent uh, uh, way. So I think uh, one way we can learn from the rodents community is uh, the uh, neuron uh, circuit mechanism. This is uh, 
very much limited in the monkey research so far. So in rodents, they have these very mature tools about like injecting virus in one area and then project to the other area. So they can specifically study a certain circuits involving more than two areas uh, in a certain uh, perceptual decision-making task. And in monkeys, it's very difficult for now for a number of reasons, including like the efficiency of the virus and including how much of the area you can uh, affect by injecting a small amount of virus. But I think this is the next step. Um, well, my personal opinion that, that the monkey community should go forward, you know, to identify a neural circuit, right? For example, you can identify, in my case, if we can identify from MT to MST, these neural circuits uh, really contribute, that would be super, right? Although it's currently limited by the techniques, but I think, but I foresee this is one very important uh, direction that for the monkey community to learn from the rodent community in the future. So this is one, uh, this is one thing. The other thing is that uh, I still think that the monkey community has much advantages uh, compared to the rodents, which is that the monkeys are very smart. They, they use tools, right? Um, they are very smart. So uh, one of my colleagues, Tenming Yang, he recently trained the monkeys uh, to perform a Pac-Man uh, game that we human, uh, most of us play, play during our childhood, right? And it turns out that after training the monkey for as short as one year, the monkey already to learn to, 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 to run this Pac-Man game by, by, by chasing the reward and avoiding the ghost. And if the task switch rule changes, they can, they can, they can trace the, the, the ghost uh, uh, on the contrary. So, and I, I can hardly imagine this can be done in the rodents community, right? And when, 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 so I think this is the something that the rodents community can learn from the uh, monkey community. So I think this is one direction the, the, the monkey community should go in the future. Uh, in summary, to develop more complex tasks uh, similar to humans, but cannot be uh, performed by rodents. Finally, I think there are also other fields that uh, monkey uh, community has a lot of advantages. For example, the visual system. The visual system is almost identical between the monkeys and uh, humans. And also the other is the motor system, which has been greatly applied in the uh, brain machine interface, right? So we have these five fingers uh, with, uh, with the action very close to human beings, the five fingers, right? And you cannot do this with the, the rodents. They can only move the arm. You can hardly imagine they can move their fingers uh, to, to, to do something very similar to human beings. So uh, in summary, I think that there, there are some, something that, especially the technique, uh, we need to learn from the rodent community. But there are also something that we have very unique uh, in our monkey community to, to pursue in the future. So this is what I think. Thank you. Thank you, Goyo. Very nice to see it. Uh, Yang Ye, uh, maybe you can uh, see. Yeah, you want? Uh, I kind of have the same ideas with all the speakers. Uh, like, I agree with uh, Winrich. And I think uh, that's also my case is um, from my undergraduate student to post uh, to PhD and to poster. I kind of be be driven by the scientific questions I'm interested in. And then I'm thinking which I, I'm thinking about <laughs> to which animals we, we should choose to answer that question. Uh, like just take my experience. Uh, when I am, uh, my background in college is physics. So I'm interested to know how the, our retina receive, or I receive like a physical light and process information. So when I have that like, idea in my mind, I joined my PhD lab, which just used the pigeon as uh, animal models to study how the virus is working and processing like uh, kind of the eye movements and acquire the optical flow, something like that. And then I also uh, motivated by the question related to eye movements. Then when I applied my peer, uh, postal position, I just choose the like a uh, eye movements lab, Steve Lisberger's lab. So it's kind of, I just uh, driven by the question uh, I'm interested and in to choose the kind of, I think the right place to, to continue my career or the questions I'm asking. And recently, I just have a kind of similar conversation with an undergraduate student from the College of uh, uh, CCAS. 
and she's a very smart student. And when she supplied my lab and she said, oh, I'm interested to know how the monkey's working. And we showed her how our daily lab experiment is. And then she said, oh, I think mice might be my interesting side because of some like a fantastic technique or something. I said, I think the, all the options is open to you, but it will depend on what kind of the key questions uh, motivated or uh, initiate you to track in the following few years. Because the researcher always need us to spend time, spend our energies to really think in deep about the questions. And if we can find that the question are interesting and we can just choose the right animal model to answer that question. So mice is okay. Um, primates like a few monkeys, they might be more intelligent brain and can, can finish some complex behavior <coughs> paradigms, maybe can open the more wider window for us. So that's what I think about it. Thank you. Liu, maybe your last one to give some thoughts <laughs> on this. So Xiaoqing raised a very, very tough question. Actually, the other day, just a couple of days ago, a student, my one of my students asked me a question. He asked why we need to use non-human primates as animal models. Because a lot of things, a lot of discoveries have already been done in rodents. So to, to, to echo with, uh, to, to answer this question, I mean, to, 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 to convince the students or postdocs, I think I will echo what Corey and uh, Gu Yong mentioned. First thing, we really needed to do some uh, comparisons uh, across species. For example, I mean, for monkeys, we know that the, the, the um, mice brain is only less than one gram. For macaques, it's more than 100 grams, and the human brain, 1,300 grams. So, so far, probably we just uh, discovered some, some quite basic questions as we discussed earlier. But still, as Gu Yong mentioned, as Corey mentioned, in more natural environment, and if we can devise some more intelligent tasks for monkeys, probably we can uh, unravel the, the complex functions of the prefrontal cortex, for example. That's what uh, we, we human beings are very proud of. We have the largest <laughs> prefrontal cortex. Otherwise, if we just uh, uh, um, use anesthetized animals or, or very simple tasks to explore brain functions, we, we cannot really take advantage of hu uh, non-human primates. Uh, another thing, I mean, to, to, to show, that, I mean, non-human primates are good animal models, is nowadays we can we have access to patients, human patients, to do some intracranial recordings because we don't we cannot communicate with monkeys. We don't know their internal state, they, their thoughts. But with human subjects, so we can communicate human subjects and know what they thought. In that case, we can answer more deep questions. I will make this comment. Thank you, Liv. Uh... I think we're running a uh, run of our time for panel discussions. Uh, the question that we just went through in the last half an hour, I hope the audience find it uh, um, intriguing and, uh, you know, enlightening. So, so maybe that's where a uh, good point to, to, uh, to end the session. It has been a long evening for Wenrik. It's a way past the middle night <laughs> for Corey and a long morning for the rest of the panel members and the speakers. So, and all of you, the five speakers have given a wonderful, uh, really outstanding talk that's uh, enlightening. And I'm sure the audience will, uh, will say, uh, feel the, share the same view. So on behalf of the organizers, Livu and Tang Ming, and uh, we're uh, very grateful for your participation. We're asked to put this together half a year ago. And, uh, and we thought this is more community and a little hesitation, but it, we're glad we did it, and, uh, and we are glad that all of you, five of you, give this very diverse and uh, complimentary uh, outstanding talk. So on behalf of everyone in the audience, uh, thank you all for your wonderful talk. So uh, we'll end our session here. And in the words of the panel discussion, I, I hope I give you guys good questions to, to think about, and uh, I, I hope students and post and the audience uh, will 
uh, things are interesting. If you have more questions for the speakers, uh, you can find their information on their website and, and uh, follow up with their work. So, uh, Liu, shall we finish here? Okay, okay. Hello. All right, okay. we'll finish bye here bye. and uh, thank, uh, you thank you so much for organizing. Thank you, Thank you, Corey. It's a long, long day for you. Nice to meet you. Bye bye. Very nice. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.